And we have a very interesting program for you. We're going to speak with Tom Horn. And we're going to speak with the one and only Josh Peck. I'll tell you, these people are really, really busy. I want to tell you a little bit about them, but first I want to tell you, the um, after that, uh, after that uh, almost, almost hour-long uh, televised thank you speech from Donald Trump last night, <laughs> you look around the news today, and there's just not that much, you know, hair-raising stuff, other than the Navy is admitting its new fleet has a near-zero chance of completing a 30-day mission. These new littoral uh, ships that they've uh, produced went hundreds of millions of dollars over budget, and they're not exactly what they were hoping for, much like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. That thing went over budget so badly it was ridiculous, and it still doesn't do everything they wanted it to do. It's, uh, it's pretty weird. That's what happens when you want the contract more than you really want the product to be good, I'm afraid. It's pretty uh, pretty tough. That was a rather inspirational speech. I got to tell you, <laughs> when I watch Donald Trump's hand gestures, it looks a little mafia, <laughs> doesn't it? I don't think all New Yorkers uh, do hand gestures like that, but the connected ones do. Uh, let's see. Over the weekend, uh, Italy is facing populist anger as populism sweeps the globe. America's white population is declining as the um, as the Hispanics population is increasing. I wonder, I wonder how that happened. Oh, I know they have larger families. Anyway, the uh, number of Caucasian babies born was not as high as the number of Caucasian post babies dying. So, look out, extinction beckons, right? $31 million stolen in a Russian hack. This whole thing about Russia hacking everything turns out to be total rubbish. And speaking of rubbish, this is a good one from uh, Zero Hedge about all this global warming and climate change, which they're trying to sort of roll into one. Global warming didn't get them very far, as you know. So they went with climate change, and we know that climate change is a, is a real thing. First of all, we have this thing called weather and uh, and we have the four seasons, and the weather changes during the four seasons when they change. And we do know that insurance policies have been written for many years, uh, pointing out things like uh, your property is on a 50-year floodplain. Your home is situated on a 100-year floodplain or a 150-year floodplain. The Almanac is still a pretty good place to uh, find out what's going to happen with your weather. They don't call it the Farmer's Almanac for nothing, and this country's eaten pretty well for, well, quite a long time. But back to this um, back to this vanishing sea ice thing. The sea ice is gone. The polar bears are stranded on little snowballs floating out there. They're having to use snowballs as floaties, the pull, p- poor bears. Well, the Telegraph.co.uk has reported the following. New analysis suggests that conditions are now virtually identical to when the Terra Nova and Endurance sailed to the South Pole, the continent of Antarctica, in the early 1900s, indicating that declines are part of a natural cycle and not the result of global warming. Here's another one. We know that sea ice in the Antarctic has increased slightly over the past 30 years since satellite observations began. Scientists have been grappling to understand this trend in the context of global warming. Well, you can grapple all you want, but within the context of global warming, you're going to come up with zip, bupkis, zeroid, nada. These new findings suggest it's not anything new. Here's another one. If ice levels were as low a century ago as estimated in this research, then a similar increase may have occurred between then and the middle of the century when previous studies suggest ice levels were far higher. Now, (laughs) Tyler Durden submitted this one. It's actually submitted by Martin Armstrong via armstrongeconomics.com. And this is what he wrote. I had a conversation in a hotel with someone who was very much a believer in man-created global warming. I began to notice a pattern to their thinking. 
When you test anything, you must see how it is connected to other reasoning. What emerged was a fundamental belief that government is good and there to take care of you until you die. This notion appears to be linked to those who just want to be taken care of, but not to the point that they are on welfare. They will pretend to be independent thinking individuals, but there is a core surrender of independence because they do not want to think no one is in charge. They voted for Hillary as well. And this all seems linked to this desire not to be responsible for the future in a subtle way. Perhaps it's linked to childhood, when you didn't have to work or cook. They just took care of you. It seems that those who believe in global warming are more likely to trust government. What happens when they wake up and discover nothing is as they thought it would be? Meanwhile, the energy output of the sun is dropping faster than anyone expected. Snow has actually begun falling in Tokyo and other parts of eastern Japan. Tokyo recorded its first November snowfall since 1875, when the government started collecting records. But hey, now they want to call this climate change and somehow still attribute this to mankind. I've said this many, many times. Mother Nature seems... Uh, Seems to think she needs to, like, save herself. She'll deal with the humans. You don't have to worry about that. Mother Nature will take care of herself. The only thing that could might maybe thwart that for a few, eh, maybe millennia, is uh, widespread detonations of uh, nuclear weapons. That, that might hold her off a little bit. But other than that, Father Son and Mother Earth, I'm not a sun worshiper. Don't anybody get crazy on the Facebook now. I'm not a Gaia kind of guy either, all right? They're going to take care of themselves. The sun does what it wants. So I know. Why don't we insist that, I know, the presence of woo-woo thinking people, misdirected as it appears to have been, has actually caused the sun to go to sleep for a while. Very, very low sunspot activity. And therefore, what we need, we need a, I know, a solar tax so that we can develop ways to make the sun behave the way we think that it should behave, rather than just get a coat when it's cold and maybe strip down to shorts and a T-shirt when it's hot. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And, you know, we used to say things like, hey, that's really crazy. Oh, hey, crazy, man, that's some crazy stuff, man. Ooh, you're crazy, but it's the good crazy, or maybe that one over there, that's the bad crazy. I'm beginning to think that these people are really members of the bad crazy sect of humanity. I mean, for example, this one character, this Yahoo News columnist, wants schools to begin to indoctrinate kids so that they will trust mainstream media and understand that the only news that they can trust must come from corporate media. I mean, this is absolutely insane. Citing a Washington Post article about face news that's been vehemently debunked for relying on a Russian propaganda list that includes even left-wing sites critical of Hillary Clinton, Matt Bay, B-A-I, or maybe that's Matt Bai, says social media giants like Facebook censoring fake news will not be enough. He says, quote, the answer doesn't lie in hectoring tech companies into policing content, but rather in teaching our kids how to consume it, R writes by before going on to argue for having media literacy classes in schools that would instruct students on how to discern trustworthy sources of information. Here's a quote. Here's a radical thought. If President Trump is looking for a bold and useful education initiative, that might serve the incidental purpose of redeeming what's left of his soul, media literacy would be a pretty good place to start. Getting behind a nationwide push in K-12 through classrooms could be an important and unifying priority for the incoming Education Secretary, Betsy DeVoe. Well, who puts out more fake news than mainstream media? Did you see that nonsense going on last night on Fox News between a lefty and a, and a righty and Megyn Kelly in the middle? I really believe Megyn Kelly should go on and make, um, make the move to CNN. She'll be welcome there. They could use the ratings. They're dismal. 
They really are. The largest Venezuelan bill of Bolivars is worth two American cents. You got to stop at about six ATMs hoping to be able to pull some money out before you can even then begin foraging for groceries somewhere. It's absolutely insane. Oil prices went into the toilet, and so did that economy. And Maduro is not doing well down there. I always blame the leader. Isn't it interesting, though? Finally, we got around to blaming President Obama for stagnant economy, poor race relations, poor foreign policy, outrageous spending. Where did all that money come from? Funding these uh, companies like Solyndra and others. While his buddy-buddy Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, puts together this foundation that hauls in countless hundreds of millions of dollars. And by the way, there is the possibility she may, she may be prosecuted still. I guess we'll have to just wait and see. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Tom Horn and Josh Peck. Tom Horn is a longtime television and radio personality. His site is skywatchtv.com. He serves as the chief executive officer of Skywatch. And at the dawn of the Internet, Tom Horn launched two news services where coverage of late-breaking news and information were on the cutting edge. Stories covering religion, prophecy, discovery, and the supernatural through in-depth investigative reports. Uh, well, this led his network of writers being referenced and interviewed by the biggest names in broadcast, including the L.A. Times Syndicate, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, Fox, Time, the New York Times, the, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, BBC, MSNBC, Michael Savage, Caravan to Midnight with John B. Wells. Thanks, Tom. Sci-Fi Channel, History Channel, Hannity and Combs, Sid Roth's It's Supernatural, The Jim Baker Show, Celebration, Daystar TV, Faith TV, The Harvest Show, The 700 Club, Coast to Coast AM, World Net Daily, Newsmax, White House Correspondents, and dozens of other news magazines and press agencies around the globe. Skywatch TV is the consummation and new mothership of Tom's several subsidiaries, including Defender Films and Defender Publishing. His uh, latest book, Abaddon Ascending. All right, now, Josh Peck is an avid researcher of fringe topics, videographer at Skywatch TV, creator of The Sharpening Report, hosted by James DeWitt and Jake Rikotska, host of Into the Multiverse, and is the author of numerous books, including Abaddon Ascending, which he did with Tom Horn, The Conspiracy at the Center of CERN's Most Secretive Mission, Quantum Creation, Does the Supernatural Lurk in the Fourth Dimension, and Cherubim Chariots, Exploring the Extra-Dimensional Hypothesis. Josh Peck has been featured on TV and radio shows, including Skywatch TV. He's been on Caravan to Midnight a couple of times, and the Hagman and Hagman R Report. He's a family man. He's married to Christina Peck, has three kids, and he works full-time in ministry, dedicating his life to Skywatch TV, into the multiverse, writing books, and providing for his family. And so, you know, the people at CERN didn't decide, oh, well, we're bored, we're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> not at all. And there are some interesting developments there. You know, the, uh, the Telegraph, in particular carried some stories from earlier in the year about um, just strange stuff happening over the CERN site. Now, when I look at it, I've seen a lot of strange stuff in Texas by way of clouds. you got clouds that look like gigantic, like Hindenburg-shaped blimps. These, I uh, can't remember what you call them. It's not a funnel cloud. That's something else. That, that, that's a, a thing that clobbers people like two days after Christmas uh, last year in Dallas. Killed a bunch of people. But these, uh, you know, you have flying saucer-looking clouds with a big thunderhead above it and, and, is and isolated thunderbursts within these thunderheads. It's not like the whole thing lights up. And uh, colors that are most unexpected, generally when you see a lightning flash, it's usually that, that yellowish-slash-white-slash-silver color, but not always. You see pink and blue, and, and then every once in a while when it's about to really get weird, the sky around here, at least, maybe it does where you are too, becomes actually green. I mean, like, 
like green, like the like the, the Scarborough Fair shirt of deep forest green. Yeah, that's that's how it gets. And the uh, the tornadoes are very tricky around here too. Speaking of, of tornadoes, there was a uh, a giant pecan tree. What was left of it? It, it I guess it had something that killed it. And there was this huge stump that was you know easily easily four feet in diameter. That was in the backyard of this house that I lived in for many years. I tried to get that thing out, put a chain on it with the, the big F-254. Forget about it. That thing's not going to move. First, I tried pushing on it. That was an absolute exercise in futility. So I got the pickup truck and a chain. Well, that was futile also. But then this uh, the sky turned green one afternoon, and I thought, oh, boy. Well, this house has been around for about 100 years. It's made mostly of stone and brick and plaster and lath and a little bit of steel in there, so we'll probably be okay. Just stay away from the windows. Well, this storm came, and it blew down a bunch of stuff all over the place, foam poles, tree limbs, great big ones, too. And when it was over, I went outside, and that this thing must have been 15 feet tall, and I repeat, about 4 feet in diameter. This thing had been pulled out of the ground and was just lying there. It didn't hit the fence. It didn't it hit the house. Nothing. It was just lifted out of the ground and laid down there. I looked at it as a demonstration of the Lord's sense of humor. Hear your voice again, Josh. Same to you. Welcome, and uh, good to have you back. Yeah. Hey, uh, John, great to talk to you again, too. By the way, I understand that a bunch of my staff is going to be with you at that Watchman conference after the first of the year, and if you're available, I'd love to have the Skywatch TV crew interview you there for some broadcast stuff for Skywatch Television. Any possibility of that? We'll we'll just make it happen. Yeah, it's more than more than possible. It's absolutely likely. All right. Well, I'll send them an email and let them know that when they get there, when they get set up to track you down, find you, and uh, that'll make for some great television. Yeah, I think uh, I think we'll have a good time with that. The uh, the Watchman Conference it should be bigger this year than uh, even last year, and there was a good turnout last year. So, or pardon me, earlier in the year. So, the year's not over yet, although it feels like it is. I'll tell you. Oh, what a year! Is this has this been amazing or what? I mean, well, this- it's been, yeah. I mean, it's been crazy, and I don't want to overshadow uh, Josh trying to get in here, but yeah, we got a lot of stuff that's not only important. We we were talking before we came on the air about. How supernatural, preternatural, uh, everything has felt lately, and that's a lot of what we want to get into during this broadcast, if possible. All right. Well, yeah, you... absolutely. And uh, you know, I just want to say, John, that uh, thank you again for having me on the show. This is my second time on, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And uh, I've been looking forward to talking with you again. And uh, I, I'm also excited uh, to be uh, joining you at the Hear the Watchman uh, conference. I'll be there as well. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a, a good time. Everybody really. Um... You know, it's one of those things where you, where you leave the, uh, that conference going, wow, what just happened? And then after a couple of days, it, it all begins to sink in because there's so much going on there that it's, uh, it's difficult to absorb it, it all while you're there. So it really hits you a couple of days after you've left. It's, uh, it's, it's very cool indeed. Josh, if you want to, um, as an avid researcher of fringe topics, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Abaddon Ascending. That is, is that the new, that's the new one, right? Yeah, yep. That's that's the one that Tom and I just put out, and um, yeah, I mean, we 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 spent the past uh, about a year uh, pulling our resources together and uh, uh, getting a lot of research for this done. Uh, CERN, it's it's well, actually it's one of the most secretive organizations of our times, but it's also uh, the secrecy that they that they have is done in such a unique way because it's put out there for everybody to see. You know, all, all the stuff that we, uh, we, we did uncover some things that, that nobody else has, but a lot of the things like about CERN wanting to open a portal, um, there's actually a quote from Sergio Bertolucci, who's the director for research and scientific computing at CERN, uh, and, and, I mean, this is stuff that's open to the public. He openly said, we plan to open a portal into an extra dimension out of this door, might come something unknown. Uh, so we, we took what's there in the public, and then we did our own investigative research uh, into CERN, what they're trying to do, what do they mean when they say they want to open a portal, uh, who are they trying to communicate with, and what that might mean uh, for the world. So that, that was our, our main motivation behind this book. You know, I, I've got a question here, because it, it really is a little bit confusing. I mean, a little bit. I went to um, I went to the actual CERN website, their homepage, 
And, you know, it's a uh, CERN is like the, uh, you know, it's a nuclear research center. Okay. But yep. there at CERN is the Large Hadron Collider. So my question is, <clears throat> you look at this apparatus and you see how much money has been spent. They talk about, uh, you know, this array of magnets of varying strengths. And uh, then once they start accelerating the particles, they squeeze them down by another array of magnets. And, and it's the same thing as, as having two needles uh, 10 kilometers apart flying through the air and somehow magically meeting halfway. And I'm thinking to myself, say, I wonder what kind of science is behind that. And then from there, it's like, well, wait a minute. These, this can't be just some sort of a hobby thing with these people because look at the amount of money that went into this project. I mean, this is some seriously expensive stuff, which makes me also wonder who is funding this. It has to be countless billions of dollars to build something like this. It's huge. And if there is a difference between CERN and the activities uh, regarding the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, definitely. There, there is an extraordinary amount of money. It's actually the world, not only is it the world's biggest machine, it's the world's most expensive machine. All the money it comes from funding uh, around, around the world. Different countries are involved in this. And actually there's a quote in the book from a physicist who said, if only the UN could cooperate together as well as uh, these other countries do at CERN, you know, we might have a, a, a happier world. But it, it, so it's, it's strange that all these countries are coming together for this effort, you know, of all efforts. It's not world hunger. It's not even world peace. It's, it's quantum physics. It's, it's uh, uh, the fabric of reality. It's opening portals to other dimensions. That's, that's what is bringing the leaders of the world together. That, that's what's uh, uh, inspiring them to put all of this money together into this into this one thing. So you're absolutely right. It's really strange, and it does bring up a lot of red flags. Well, and and uh, John, if I can just jump in here, I mean, on the surface, it's it's particle physicists. I mean, they're just trying to understand the fabric of reality. That's why they were looking for the Higgs boson, which they thought either the Higgs or the Higgs field might have something to do with what gives matter. You know, but the average person out there doesn't ever stop to think about the fact that they are really uh, almost entirely made out of motion. They're not made out of matter. They're made out of electrons spinning around protons, all this stuff. I mean, it, 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 if you were to squeeze down to the actual matter that the average human body is made out of, it would disappear on the head of a pin. So how does this work? What holds everything together? What are these particles? What are the subatomic particles? And that's basically part of what they're trying to figure out at CERN. So they do what you were saying a moment ago. They're speeding up protons at the speed of light, or nearly the speed of light. They use these giant magnets to squeeze them down into a valley that is about the size of a human, the width of the size of a human hair. They collide them together at these astronomical speeds, and they burst apart into their subatomic particles. Then they've got several cameras inside that system that film those explosions. And then they wait to see what's happening with the particles. So a lot of this is really just the, the, it's the most advanced experiments in the history of humanity to try to get behind the discovery of the, the, the essence of matter. But then uh, they're also trying to figure out if they can prove, if they can put some legs behind some of the more exotic theories like the multiverse or string theory or brain theory are there other dimensions that exist around us now they have evidence that there are um, because of dark matter uh, we can't see dark matter but we can see dark matter's gravitational pull on other planets and stuff so we know that it's there and actually the, in in the dark matter world there's more matter there than there is in the world that we see in our three-dimensional reality so partly they're also trying to make discovery around, you know, what is going on in what is an invisible reality that is all around us? And are there intelligences there? I mean, there have been documentaries that have made. Brian Green, a really popular physicist, Josh can speak more to him than I can, but he, they put out a documentary a while back in which they're talking about gravitons. This is the theoretical particle that gravity is made out of, and they're interested in gravitons and from a string theory point of view because they believe that gravitons are a weak particle that exists 
uh, within uh, their own closed loop. In other words, they're not tied to this reality, and they may potentially be able to escape this reality into another into another parallel universe. And they believe that some of the experiments that they've done at CERN illustrate that fact. In other words, in some of these particle collisions, they've seen uh, what they think might be gravitons disappearing into another reality, not decaying into a different kind of a particle, literally going somewhere else. And we know that matter doesn't just go somewhere else, right? Well, the fixed laws of reality as we understand them, the four strong, you know, the strong uh, forces and whatever, and entropy and, 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 and all the rules of physics as we understand them that have been verified, actually, at CERN, don't explain for the disappearance of gravitons unless they are escaping into a parallel reality. Now, what makes this very interesting, and, and Josh goes into this in great detail in the new book, Abaddon Ascending, and I'll explain in a second why we're referring to Abaddon, this ancient demonic destroyer. Um, but Josh goes into detail, he can describe it better than I can, how they intend to use gravitons, therefore, as kind of like a computer code. But if they can control them, if they can manipulate them, if they can control their spin, they might be able to put them together in a series of, think of it as computer code, and then send it through this doorway at CERN into a parallel reality to say, hey, we're here, are you there, contact us. And that's why Sergio Bertolucci, the uh, science director at CERN, said in a public interview, we are going to open a doorway at CERN, and we are going to send something through. Something might also come back, what he called unknown unknowns. So they literally are admitting openly that they are going to open a doorway to a parallel universe, and they are trying to make contact with what might be on the other side. Now, uh, the, the part that I want to get into, if we, have the time, if we have time here today, is what does this have to do, not just with physics, but with metaphysics, with the supernatural realm, as I might uh, refer to it, because there's also been some other stuff going on, including some of the people that work at CERN. For instance, uh, some of the employees at CERN recently conducting uh, what they called a parody of a human sacrifice at CERN in front of the giant statue of the god Shiva. Now, why in the world would they be creating a parody of a satanic human sacrifice? These are employees of CERN. These are people with pass cards. Uh, why in the world are they doing that? And that's just the tip of the bow uh, on uh, what we uncovered in terms of the occult connection. And we think we we think we uncovered some stuff that... It's going to be very unnerving for a lot of people when they read Abaddon Ascending. And, John, just to quickly answer your second question, you asked what the difference between CERN and the LHC is. So just for the audience that these terms are, are brand new, the LHC is uh, the machine. That's the actual particle collider. It's, it's uh, an acronym for Large Hadron uh, Collider. And then CERN is just the, uh, the governing body. Uh, that makes all the decisions of what they're going to use the LHC for, what different experiments and stuff like that. So when we talk about CERN and the LHC, that's what we're that's what we're referring to. What significance does the um, the hadron or hadron part in uh, LHC? What what's the hadron part? What does that even mean? Is that somebody's name or is it a technique or what no, is it? it a hadron is is just a type of a type of particle. So. Okay. It's like a classification of a, a, a particle that has a certain set of attributes. So basically, they, they usually use protons. A proton can be considered uh, a hadron. It's, it's in that group. Uh, so hadrons is just a single grouping of, of a certain type of particle, but sometimes they'll use ions, which are also hadrons. So when they say that it's uh, the Large Hadron Collider, um, they only work with hadron-type particles to, to collide in this machine. You know, I'm looking at this uh, this article from Express.co.uk that was published uh, back in June of this year. Yep, June uh, June 29th, and John Austin did it. John with no H, and they got a picture here of what appears to me to be a, a good old Texas thunderstorm with a couple of extra touches. You know, there's uh, this distorted flying saucer-looking shape with some big thunderheads above it, and what appears to be a lot of rain underneath, but. 
you know, the note here under the photograph is that conspiracy theorists say this cloud or whatever was full of energy taken in by the the uh, Large Hadron Collider. It says LCH here, but I think they meant LHC. And uh, some people claim to have seen faces in it and all that. And, and here's the thing. I am an enthusiast. I like this kind of stuff. But I'm sort of the skeptical enthusiast because... You know, I also saw how the uh, the left wing was behaving at some of their moronic protests, and um, and they're absolutely so completely sure that they are sure, and yet their arguments make no sense. So when somebody starts saying, I saw faces in it, I'm like, okay. And if they say, it looks to me like it was sucking energy out of the cloud into the collider. Okay, yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there, and, I, and even if I was there, maybe I would have thought the same thing, but... But where do we draw the line between people going nuts with their conspiracy theories and then putting this stuff out all over the web and what is actually happening at CERN? Absolutely. And that, that's something that we cover uh, right off the bat in the book because there is a lot of information out there. Um, as far as the specific article you're referring to, I'm not sure if I've read it. I'd have to, I'd have to look at it to know, uh, to know for sure. But uh, in our research, we have come across a lot of uh, misinformation attempts. There was actually one video that went viral uh, around the time we were researching for this. And I, I did some analysis on it, and I had my friend uh, Richard Shaw, who's he, he's, a, he's a, a movie director, and I had him look at it. And uh, we, both, uh, we both came to the conclusion that it was, it was, it was a fake. Um, but the, the problem is not everybody is going to have access to those types of things to be able to vet this stuff. That's why we have to be very careful. There's also another uh, viral story going around. It's still going around and has been for a while. Uh, basically, the title of it uh, usually is something like, uh, I'm a physicist at CERN and we've done something we, we regret or something like that. And then when you go to read this thing, it, it reads as if it's a confession from a, a physicist at CERN saying that, uh, they did this experiment, and they they amped up the energy way more than they were supposed to, and uh, you know all, all, all these strange things happen. Uh, but actually, when you when you uh, follow that to its root, it was actually written as a short story. It was a Reddit post. It, it was never meant to be um, to be recognized as anything truthful. It was somebody wrote it as a fictional short story. Then somebody else came along, took it, and then started spreading around it, spreading it around as if it were true. And because quantum physics is so mysterious, and because not a lot's known about it, um, it's, I think it's easy for people. And I'm not blaming people for this. This is, uh, you know, people are being taken advantage of, unfortunately. But it's, it's easy for people to look at something like that, especially if it's sensational, and think, well. That might be true. You know, maybe that can happen. Quantum physics is strange. You know, the uh, CERN is definitely mysterious. And then they share it. It gets, you know, the story gets shared around. And, uh, so a lot of that stuff, um, it, it really takes a lot of uh, uh, research to, to be able to vet any of it. So I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm, I'm an enthusiast, but I'm also kind of skeptical at heart, too. Uh, but there are, and this is a strange thing, there are a lot of actual truthful things that are going on that have a lot of evidence to back it up that are that would probably be considered uh, even more sensational than the misinformation that's out there. So it, it's strange that people would want to want to take that stance when the truth truly is stranger than fiction. Well, and I'm just like you guys. I mean, I first of all, I am a believer. Uh, I do believe that we are surrounded by if you want to use the term parallel realities or whatever whatever term you want to put on it, the idea that we that there is a veil between our three dimensional reality or four if you add time, this reality and some other reality around us. I mean I'm a literalist, I'm a biblical literalist. I believe that that is true. Um and uh and most of the people I know and hang out with believe that that is true. Uh and and so on the one hand, with the dawn of the internet uh, it's been the greatest thing since apple pie. It's the information highway. We have access to more information now than we could have ever dreamed of. The downside is that you do have an awful lot of people out there that produce this fake stuff. And with some of the new uh, programs now that you can do, you can use for manipulating film and also manipulating uh, images, it's just so easy for people to create fake stuff that you spend a huge amount of time trying to get behind, trying to get behind it. Now that story that you were referring to a moment ago, uh, John, there actually was a real story, and that is, if you, if you recall, 
when something broke on the Large Hadron Collider here, I don't know, 24 months ago, 18 months ago, something like that, and had to shut it down for a little while, when they started it back up, they were saying, we're going to go to our highest uh, power output ever. Yeah. And when they started that back up, they, there were people all along the Swiss border that were reporting that they were seeing giant beings. There did seem to be some anomalous activity that was going on uh, up above uh, Switzerland, the, the clouds that were swirling. There was a, like a spiral vortex type thing. And some of that was reported by mainstream news media that was filming it. So there was some reality. Well, then within a few days, the very same images were being posted online. The film was being posted online. But now it was showing a UFO coming down out of the middle of it and zapping something with a big beam. And, and it was all completely fake. But they started with something, like Josh was saying a moment ago, that actually was very intriguing and made you wonder if something that they were doing at CERN was not, in fact, somehow tempering with the atmosphere and creating what you might think of as a as a vortex or uh, something like that. Now, if you add to that the esoteric quality, uh, I mean, I wonder how many people know that the Large Hadron Collider is actually situated right above uh, what was known in ancient times as St. Genus Poeli, or in the Roman times was known as Apoliacom, where there was a temple there to the god Apollo, or Abaddon, as we've used that title on our uh, book, or Apollyon from the Greek uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 9. Uh, and they built a temple there to him, and they believe that that location, the very location that is in the center, at the heart of the Large Hadron Collider, the ancients believed that that was actually the doorway to the abusos, to the abyss, to the underworld, to what the book of Revelation calls the bottomless pit. And they believed that down beneath the surface of the earth there uh, was this pit in which Abaddon, the king of the underworld, uh, existed. And because Abaddon slash Apollyon slash put any other of the ancient names you want to put on him, Osiris, Apollo, Nimrod, whatever, this ancient legendary character, since he's predicted in all kinds of ancient texts, not just biblical, but also biblical, as returning at the end of time, and because his return is coupled with the idea that a doorway has to be opened. At Revelation 9, a mighty angel descends down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit, and he opens that doorway, and all these you know, horrible insectoid transgenic beings start coming up onto the surface of the earth, torturing mankind, and it says, and they have a king over them whose name is Abaddon, and whose name in the Greek tongue is known as Apollyon or Apollo. So the fact that that, that prophecy is widespread, both biblical and extra-biblical, and that it's coupled with the idea that a doorway is going to have to be opened, and that the CERN is actually built right over the top of where the ancients believed that doorway was, and that they are saying we are going to open a doorway. There's a great deal of intrigue uh, around this. Uh, and, and then, of course, you know, the giant statue of Shiva right outside the doorway, which is the god in Hindu belief that destroys at the molecular level. So now, again, we're talking about particle physics. It destroys at the molecular or the particle level. Uh, physics level, and then it reconstructs. And the whole idea behind Shiva is that it's going to give birth to a new world order, to a better world order. And once again, that ties to all of the prophecies, including the prophecies on the Great Seal of the United States of America that predict the second coming of Apollo, Abaddon, Apollyon, uh, and that it will give birth to a new world order. It makes me want to ask, do these people know what they're doing, really? I, I mean, I take it that they do, but I wonder if it's going to come under the, uh, under the category of, well, forgive them, Father, because they really don't know what they're doing. I mean, do these... Yeah, in my, in, in my personal belief, I've, uh, I've talked to a few of these businesses, and I've listened to, to some of their other presentations and stuff online. Um, I, I believe I, probably 99% of the employees at CERN uh, a, lo a lot of the physicists that, that uh, may not even be on the ground but work with CERN and work with the data that they collect, uh, I think most of them don't really have a grasp on uh, the esotericism behind, behind all this. I think that a lot of them are just in it for the science uh, because they have a love and passion for science and they want to learn more about reality. But in saying that, 
I do also believe, um, and this came out in, in the research for this book, I, I, I do believe that there's a type of, of shadow governing body somewhere in the depths of CERN uh, that's pulling the, the strings to make all this happen. And we got a little glimpse of that uh, with, this, uh, with, with this parody of a human sacrifice in front of the, the, the Shiva statue. And actually, Tom could speak more to that than, uh, than I could. But that, that gave us a glimpse that there are, there are at least uh, some employees there that know exactly what's going on, and they're trying to perpetuate it. Yeah, well, absolutely. So you, when you think, so think of it this way, um, John. What you just said, you know, about do they know what they're messing with? Is it kind of like Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? And both Josh and I agree that uh, there's got to be tons of people that are working uh, uh, in at CERN and 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 for, for that matter internationally that also do work that's connected to CERN. Uh, and and these are not occultists. These are not bad people. These are not people that want to open, you know, the pit and unleash demons on earth. I mean, that would be the part of the thing from their imagination. But as with anything, and in fact, we can talk about this in a moment, including our own U.S. government, you have the people that are there. These are just good people, representative government, trying to do the best job they can. But we know that there is an occult underpinning. There is an occult elite. There is a voice behind the voice. There is a government behind the government. That's true in Washington. That's true at the Vatican. The Vatican, you have the white pope. You have the black pope. Uh, you could go all around the world. And in all of these institutions, they're also behind that is this other influence, this elitist influence. And so when you think about the arrival of Abaddon, not only was it prophesied, but the, here, there's, there's a very intriguing thing here that's missed, even by most Bible scholars, and I've been doing this for so many decades I can't really count. I'm getting old, John. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but I, and I have never heard anybody point this out before, so maybe somebody has. I've never seen it. But when you read Revelation 9, uh, and it talks about the doorway of the earth, the, the bottomless pits open, Abaddon comes up out of the bottomless pit. The Apostle Paul referred to him, and he says that the Antichrist will be possessed by the spirit of uh, this, by the spirit, Apollyon. Uh, he calls him the son of perdition, the word perdition, there's the Greek, Apollyon, Abaddon. Uh, Revelation 17:8 says the beast will rise up out of the bottomless pit and go into Abaddon, Apollyon, the, the Antichrist, if you will. So there's going to be the incarnation of the spirit on earth. He's going to be the final day king uh, over earth. But here's the part that people don't talk about, and that is as all these hellish things are released from the bottomless pit and it's torturing humanity. It's, it, by the way, it can't touch those who are sealed with the seal of God. So uh, if you if you know who you are and where you are in God, you don't have to worry about this. But So it's torturing humanity. But then look at what it says in verse 21. All these people are being tortured. Here's the part that the scholars miss. It says, and yet they repented not of their sorcery. And the word sorcery there in the Greek is pharmakia, which everybody knows is that that word that is used both in the Old and New Testament to refer to an effort to open a doorway to a parallel reality, to make contact with those who are on the other side. So there is, there was, there's obviously an effort here on the part of those who are finally being tortured. There was an effort on their part, in other words, uh, to um, contact, to open a doorway, to, to invite, if you will, into our three-dimensional reality, uh, this this other darkness. And this is one of the things that concerns me a lot, and we go on into this in Abaddon Ascending, and that is this giant question. Have you ever seen so much occultism moving into the mainstream in the history of our nation? It's, it's everything from little things like, uh, and I'm not you know, undervaluing the importance of this, but it's things like Satan clubs that are opening up on grade schools for children across the nation. It's things like Baphomet satanic statues being erected on public grounds uh, and being proposed for public places like Oklahoma, Detroit, and so on. It's also then, though, the satanic sacrifice that was performed at CERN or the parody of... And by the way, 
just because it's a parody doesn't mean it wasn't powerful. All of Aliaster Crowley, the Book of the Law, all of this dark Satanism says that where you can't actually have a satanic sac a blood sacrifice, you do it as a parody. It's like a talisman. Everybody knows that symbolism can also be a powerful invitation for a gateway or a doorway to be open. Then add to that the all day long Gotthard Base Tunnel satanic ceremony in the Swiss Alps in Switzerland, not far from CERN, that was recently attended by government leaders. So you take all of this stuff, but then, John, and this bothered me or concerned me more than anything else. Take what we learned through the WikiLeaks revelations. Now we started learning, uh, uh, and I don't know, I'm not saying this involved Hillary Clinton herself, but it certainly involved those who are and were around her, campaign chairman John Podesta, his brother Tony Podesta, others who, who God only knows how many in the U.S. government, involving things like spirit cooking. And most of the public is completely unaware where that comes from, what it means, and, and what it's part of. It's really only the tip of the, uh, 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 of the uh, sword um, where you're using things like you know, menstrual blood and semen and breast milk and urine, and, and you're mixing all of this together with congealed blood, uh, and then you're doing these, uh, well, the the one that you can watch online with Marina Abramovic is where she's painting on the wall with it, and she's talking about sticking a knife in the middle finger of your hand and cutting through and eating the pain. And that, that's a part of it. Uh, but this actually all comes from uh, Aliasta Crowley, the Book of the Law, which I studied at length years ago as a researcher, but not as a student. Uh, and uh, spirit cooking is a part of the Black Mass uh, in one instance, where you want to perform a blasphemy of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so you use the elements from spirit cooking uh, to be able to do that. But anyway, when you look at these, when you look at these emails, there, there's something here that is very scary, and that is the nature of the emails are intimate. What do I mean by that? I mean that when Tony Podesta is emailing John Podesta, and he's saying, hey, Marina would like to know if you'd like to come over to her house for a spirit cooking dinner, and if you're going to be in New York on XYZ date, uh, maybe you could come by. That kind of language implies that these are all people who know each other, and they're very comfortable with talking with each other about this. So if I, if I were going to send some crazy email to John Wells and I invite him to a spirit cooking dinner and we never had developed this relationship, I wouldn't just say, hey, John, are you going to be in town on Tuesday? If you are, Marina would like you to come over. This implies these people all know each other and that they've been participating in, in and, and this stuff, this stuff is, I mean, it is the edge of an earthquake in terms of the levels of the highest uh, ordinances of Thelema, the religion Thelema. In fact, now we've turned up the, term, the word Thelema also being interchanged in these uh, emails, and, and Josh and I are going to be producing a lot more on this in the days ahead. But this is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this is some really, really scary stuff. And if nothing else, what it showed was that, Podesta and some of the people hanging out with him, these people were involved in the highest level of Satanism, and they also believed that Hillary Clinton might have had a, a, a predestined role in the coming of Abaddon the Destroyer. Yeah, and just to, just to jump in real quick, too, I think that this also uh, speaks to the level of ignorance uh, in the world today, and I don't say that insultingly. Um, again, I, I believe that people are being victimized. I, I don't. I don't think that. Uh, I don't use the term ignorant insultingly, but it really shows how much people can get away with in the world when you call it art, uh, because all of this stuff was presented by the, uh, the, the the very few mainstream media that would even touch it. You know, mo most just buried it under the rug and didn't even talk about it. But when it was talked about, it, it was represented as artistic. Uh, you know, I mean, e even something to uh, be admired, uh, like, oh, she has such an artistic soul, isn't this beautiful? But, I mean, it's just downright Satanism. But because we live in the type of world that we live in, anybody can get away with anything if it's called art or even science. If it's called science, they can get away with anything. So I think that speaks to our culture 
as well. And, uh, I, I mean, I, even 10, 20 years ago, this would have just been absolutely crazy. You know, these people would have been demonized for doing these sorts of things, but now it's celebrated. Uh, we even saw that at the, the Gothard Tunnel uh, base ceremony too like oh it's just culture it's just they're expressing their beliefs and and their art and everything um so it's it's just crazy how how much the world has changed in such a short amount of time and why uh research like this research like we put in abbott on ascending is so vital for people to grab a hold of now because this stuff is ramping up exponentially if it got this if it got this intense in just a matter of a decade or a few years Imagine what the next couple of years is going to be like. Uh, so I, I would encourage people to, to grab, grab a hold of this now. Yeah, I mean, I, okay, so you could call anything art, right? I mean, let, let's say you're going to get a, a bunch of children, pedophiles, you're going to take them out into some, uh, some room somewhere and everybody's going to rape them and call it art. Look, there's a line that you can't possibly cross over, and anybody with any common sense would not see that as uh, art. When when Marina is is, is telling people to carve a, a butcher knife into their hand and eat the pain, when in another one of her uh, uh, you know recorded displays she literally pulls out her 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 fingernail, she pulls out her toenails, she cuts off her hair, she throws it in a giant flaming fine pointed star that's on fire, then she jumps into the fire and goes completely unconscious, and people have to drag her out to save her life. Look. This is Mark chapter 9, where demons are trying to kill a boy by throwing him into the fire, and they've got to be delivered by Jesus Christ. I, here's what I would tell people. Look, I, I actually hate for you to see this, but you can go to Google, and you can, you can type in Marina's name, or better, even type in La Mocha, L-A-M-O-C-A, Gala Performance, and look at what happened this year, where she's at this annual event at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, and... All of the Hollywood elite, I mean the biggest stars in Hollywood, the top star. you'll be shocked if you look at these images at who is at this thing. Uh, they all come together, uh, and then uh, they all sit around these big tables, and the big tables in the middle of them have what's supposed to look like a decapitated head. It's actually somebody sitting under the table with their head stuck up through a hole, and then the tablecloth goes around them. They're eating... Uh, spaghetti that is intentionally made to look like human intestines. They're eating that. They're eating tartar and other raw meats and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, uh, these men come walking out, and they're carrying this platform, this the, the, whatever, I don't know what you call it, just a giant platform. Uh, and uh, there is a, a, a shape. It's a female. She's dressed in uh, red. She represents the whore of Babylon, and she's this is supposed to represent either an amniotic sac, so she's about to be born, or others say it represents the surface of the earth. So this is the whore of Babylon getting ready to be born or come up out of the surface of the uh, earth. Uh, and so she cuts her way out from this giant platter with a knife, jumps up on stage, starts singing. It turns out it's, it's Debbie Harry, the singer. Uh, but this is where the spirit dinner gets really weird. Uh, they carry out the, these life-size forms of nude female women, and they are very realistic-looking. They're renditions, actually, of Marina Abramovic and Mrs. Harry, who's up on the stage with a large knife. Large knife. She goes over and plunges her knife into uh, her own heart, her own likeness, into its heart. She cuts out her heart. It's all red and bloody-looking. She holds it up over the top of her head. All the Hollywood elites start cheering. And then everybody in the room, the Hollywood elite, they all start cannibalizing these nude bodies. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the irony here is that this, the, the, the material that these nude bodies are made out of is the spirit cooking recipe. So their sperm, you know, all, I don't even want to go into it. It's just it is the nastiest, terriblest stuff on earth. And all these Hollywood elite are cheering as they're cutting their own pieces off of these human female bodies and eating them. And the, and the irony here is these are the liberal elites who are supposed to be the ch champions of women's rights, and they're celebrating the parody of murdering and cannibalizing women. It's just the most, it's the most astonishing, disgusting thing ever. So 
I think there's a line you don't cross over, and you don't say this is art. You admit what it is for real. This is right out of the book of Philema. This is Satanism, and, and, it, and it just simply illustrates how many people are part of this dark ceremony. But don't forget, when it came to Aliaster Crowley and, and the OTO members of his religion in Philema, they were not just doing this just to be disgusting. They were doing this intentionally to open a doorway through which they could invite contact. The whole purpose, even behind spirit cooking, if somebody wants to, uh, to read about that, is it's meant to create a union between you, mankind, and supernatural entities that I would call the demonic world. The whole purpose, make contact, break down the doorway, what the Bible would call, you know, pharmakia. This idea that you are going to use, whether, whether it's a shaman using mind-inducing drugs, whatever it is, the purpose behind it is to open a doorway to put you in contact with supernaturalism. Wow. Well, you know, going all the way back to um, Marquis de Sade, all these stories about, um, I don't know, this couple had this child and did a bunch of abuse to the child and then threw it in the fire and all this other stuff. I think it was a daughter, actually. Threw it in the fire and all of this. I mean, these, um, and I remember there was this book when I was in junior high school, it was circulating around, somebody got hold of it. The um, the history of torture, and you see all these, um, you, you read all this stuff, about, I mean, everything from racks to stuff going on in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and all this stuff, and I'm going, yeah, okay, okay. But, I mean, it's easy, pretty easy to come to the conclusion that mankind has been um, self-destructive, self-destructive, exo-destructive, kinky, weird, vile, perverse, deviant, and crazy for as long as we've been able to record their their uh, antics in the uh, the annals of history. However, when you start looking at people, um, I mean, take for example this thing that's that's popped up about um, robots, sex bots. Yeah. You know what they call them? Uh, silicon combines now, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know you got you got Westworld and you got this other one, Humans. On I guess it must be on BBC Four, maybe. But um, I can't imagine deciding to make a a union with an android that you know is a machine that's programmed to talk to you, and it's you know who knows? Maybe it's got some real. Real serious AI installed there on on its um, on its little computer and uh, can actually talk with you and respond to you just exactly like a human. But it seems to me that that way madness lies if you decide that you're going to fall in love with a robot and sleep with the robot and have sex with the robot and everything else. Then we transition from that over you know uh, family stabbed by uh, by a son at uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, somebody flips out, cuts somebody's ear off over a subway seat in New York. And then uh, maces a bunch of other people, and then okay, those are the nut cases. And uh, <clears throat> on Drudge Report, you f- frequently find car of filth, house of filth, tree house of filth, hut of filth. You know, eighty-five dogs and cats living with one person. Uh, you know, at, so I wonder: Do we have any reason to believe? I mean, the numbers of people have increased on the face of the earth. But do we have any reason to believe that their behavior has changed into what we see today from anything that's gone on in the past? It seems like people have been doing this, coming up with some sort of a uh, a spirit to sacrifice to or some sort of a, they just, they'll, if they don't have a, a little demigod or a god handy, they'll make one up and then start cutting people up and sacrificing them uh, to this god that they just invented. I mean, is there anything to suggest that Human human beings have changed at all, or that we're any closer to the end of the line now than we were, I don't know, 3,000 years ago when people were doing the same thing all over the world, wherever they could get an opportunity to do it. Well, actually, John, in the history you know, of the world, in the history of the church, many, many years ago, you know, so back in the pagan era, the pagan days, you definitely had child sacrifices that were, you know, the god of Molech, all of this paganism, and then... From the advent of the gospel, from the, t- the time that Jesus came, he gives his disciples power, and they go out and they begin preaching the gospel. And within 150 years of that moment, all of these pagan temples, stuff that had been around for 2,000 years, 
was lying in ruins. And that's why it was said about them that they turned the world literally upside down. And But then, of course, it, it went... You know, it went forward. We had that was uh, the first age of enlightenment, but then darkness came, and the dark ages, and and they started kind of returning back to uh, some of these pagan roots again. And then there were great awakenings. So, you know, Jonathan Edwards comes along, and there's a great spiritual awakening, and people turn their their back on the paganism, if you will, and now they and you know now they're living for a higher cause. They're becoming their better self, their better angels, whatever terms a person wants to put around it. And so that's kind of the course of history, that there have been awakenings in which people become their better selves. And even the United States of America, this idea, we refer to this, Ronald Reagan repeated this too, uh, that this was a city on a hill. It was a a great idea. It was a great experiment. And as America did well, it also, though, you know, sent missionaries around the world to be preachers of the gospel. Uh, Over the last few decades, it seems like we've returned now to more of a moment of darkness. And uh, when you were talking a moment ago about, you know, children uh, being misused, things like that, that too is right out of the book of Philema. Aliaster Crowley saying, you know, that one of the best, if you can't get the menstrual blood of a woman, the next best to that is the blood of a child. So, th- th- so now, here we are, we're back again. And by the way, the spirit cooking revelations and the Podesta emails actually might contain code for child sex trafficking. And I'm not the first person that has said that. We're going to be spending a great deal of time investigating that. Hagman and Hagman and I were working on some stuff. Uh, but, but I think there's some stuff hidden behind mentions of types of food, the so-called pizza parties, because this seems to be connected to uh, Laura uh, Silsby, the missionary that was jailed for six months after her organization, the New Life Children's Refuge, was trying to smuggle children out of Haiti into the Dominican Republic uh, and and remember, some of these WikiLeaks emails revealed that Hillary's top aide, Huma Abedin, she was forwarding numerous articles about these New Life children uh, to the to the Clintons, and I don't want to get into all that, you know, because this goes into the, you know, the, the, what what do they call it, the sex island, and how many times Bill and Hillary were both there and whatever. But but I've been told that uh, uh, the, there, is, there is actually evidence right now that the U.S. government is temporarily sitting on. Maybe they're sitting on until there's a transition at, at, the, at the executive level. Um, and, but I've been told that it is so disgusting involving not just spirit cooking, but that as well as children, the pizza parties, uh, maybe even cannibalism, that it is so disgusting that the FBI is unsure if it should ever actually ever be publicly uh, released. So who knows? Uh, you know, we're going to find out more uh, about that. But uh, but again, to me, you know, look, Aliester Crowley, so think about this now, because in the book Abaddon Ascending, we do more in that book than I've ever done before to discuss this idea, this big idea that biblically, prophetically, metaphysically, historically, whatever, that there are areas in the heavens and on earth where there are gateways that exist, and that under certain circumstances, those doorways can be opened, and supernaturalism, supernatural entities, uh, can move back and forth into this reality. Well, behind the spirit-cooking Podesta emails, is the, it, this is derived from the teachings of Aliaster Crowley. And what was it that Crowley was trying to do in 1918? He performs this whole series of, uh, 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 of uh, rituals that he called the Amalantra working. And the whole purpose behind the Amalantra working was to open a doorway between our reality and another reality. And at one point, Aliaster Crowley says that he was successful. He opened the doorway, and an entity came through it that he called Lamb, L-A-M. People can go to Google and type in L-A-M, Aliaster Crowley. They can look at the image. looks a lot like the alien grays of later uh, reports. But he says that he opened the doorway. Now, what does this have to do with Hillary and occultism and spirit cooking? Well, uh, later in 1946, L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of the Church of Scientology, which is all based on contact with ancient aliens, uh, and then Jack Parsons, who started the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and later blew himself up. Um, but they were both students of Aliesta Crowley and OTO and Philema, and they wanted to repeat 
what uh, Aliester Crowley had done. So they started a ritual called the Babylon working, B-A-B-A-L-O-N, the Babylon working, uh, to open a portal, and they used sex magic, spirit cooking. It was all exactly the same stuff that are referred to in the Podesta emails, the same kind of a, you know occult rituals. And they were, but but what they were hoping to do, and this ties back maybe to Hillary, what they were hoping to do was to uh, bring through that portal the archetype divine feminine, a female child, a giborim, uh, the whore of Babylon. They wanted to bring that spirit through, and they claimed later, or uh, Jack Parsons claimed later, that they did. And as a matter of fact, in his biography, he has kind of a celebratory statement that he published in there in which he said that in 1946, uh, the whore of Babylon, the seed of Babylon, came through and was incarnated within a female child in 1946, that it would be born in 1947, and that this female child would go on to become the most famous feminist uh, uh, on earth and that she would influence governments around the world. So now you fast forward, uh, and I'm just throwing this out there, but uh, 1947, Hillary Clinton is born. And when you look at what was going on in these Podesta emails, it is very, very clear that some of them did and may still do believe that she was the incarnation of that spirit. Why do I say that with such confidence? Because they were practicing exactly Exactly. The same magic, the same rituals, the same spirit cooking, all of it that came out of Aliester Crowley and Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard and their attempt to incarnate the whore of Babylon. They're practicing all of exactly the same stuff based around the idea that in 1947 a woman was going to be born who would go on to become a global leader and the most well-known feminist on the face of the earth. So they totally believed that Hillary was that one. Now, uh, I'd say one final thing about this, and that is, uh, it, you know, right now, unless something extraordinary happens, uh, you know, Hillary is not going to be the president. She's already uh, alluding to the fact that maybe, maybe in 2020, she's going to put her name back out there as a presidential contender. Well, guess what? If she does, she'll be 72, 72, 72 years old, which is the highest number in all of occultism, including Thelemic uh, occultism, but also Freemasonic occultism, because that is the number of the cosmocrators that control the world, the number of the watchers, if you will, that rebelled against God and came down to the earth. And this is the reason why in Freemasonry and all these other occult orders, and including Jewish Kabbalah, all of them, 72 is the most sacred number. It's why when you go into the U.S. Capitol Dome, and you step down underneath the apotheosis of George Washington and the other underbelly of ISIS there. That's why when you look up, there are 72 uh, pentagrams around the base of that incarnation of George Washington becoming a pagan god, because they know that uh, they have to control, they somehow have to bind and loose control in their invocations these very, very powerful 72 <clears throat> fallen angels that control the governments of the world. Wow. So, well, hmm. you know, uh, an interesting, this, this seems like a little bit of a side trip, and maybe it is, but, you know, when Donald Trump was giving his, um, his thank you tour speech last night in uh, Ohio, you know, it, it was pointed out to me that what he was doing was actually biblical, in that way that if, if two are in agreement and they agree to it in the name of the Lord, it will happen. A lot of people say, oh, really? And they're rolling their eyes. But, well, let me put it to you this way. I haven't seen it fail yet. And I've been around a while, too. And when he, when he called on everyone to share and agree on the vision, it was pointed out to me that what he was doing was actually biblical. He was getting people to be in agreement to go forward. Uh, with this with this plan to restore the nation. Okay. Well, I take it that... Now, the Bible goes both ways on this. So if a couple of people are in agreement that they're going to do something that's contrary to what uh, Scripture tells us we should be doing, if if we want to see anything good on the other side of this life, 
In other words, when these people like Podesta and the rest of them, of course, there's there's been a rumor now that uh, Breitbart was going to release something about Podesta, and that that's actually what got him killed. I mean, who knows? But, um, you know, whether or not any Satanism really has any effect on anything in the minds of people who really aren't interested in this stuff, if enough people up there believe that it is effective... It appears that they can not only cause bad things to happen or what normal people would consider to be bad things to happen, you know, like abusing children and ritual sacrifice of children, adults, you know, uh, usually women. If uh, enough of them believe that this is a real thing, then it seems that the dark one, Satan, actually provides some protection for them so that they can continue doing it. Now, if you don't agree in any way, just just smack it down and, and let me have it. But that's kind of what it looks like from where I'm sitting right now. Well, actually, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I've, I've noticed a similar uh, phenomenon. Um, and actually, this, this kind of uh, leads into uh, some strange territory, because I believe that what you're describing we're actually seeing now in the movement for official disclosure. Uh, And this is something else that's come out in the Podesta emails, because there are a lot of people uh, all across America that are really pushing for uh, the government to release what they know about uh, extraterrestrials. Well, John Podesta was one of them. And and for those who might not be familiar with him, he was the former chairman of uh, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. He was chief of staff to Bill Clinton and counselor to Barack Obama. But in the WikiLeaks email, what was in uh, the emails, what was exposed, was that John Podesta was in contact with uh, Edgar Mitchell, who was uh, an Apollo 14 astronaut, sixth man on the moon, uh, and they talked a lot about uh, disclosure, and they set up uh, meetings through these emails. Now, there were, there were a lot of common themes through all these emails, and we're, Tom and I are still in the process of cataloging them, because there's, there's a lot of them, and they, they keep coming in almost on a daily basis. Um, so, But in all these emails... There's always a push for meetings concerning official disclosure. Sometimes Hillary Clinton is mentioned, sometimes Barack Obama is mentioned, sometimes even Pope Francis is mentioned uh, in these meetings. Uh, And it's interesting because Hillary Clinton, uh, during her campaign, she made that odd statement that if she were elected president, she would do everything that she could uh, to uh, release what the government knows about aliens. Uh, well, that was Podesta. That was Podesta influencing that. And actually, uh, when Obama's term was coming to an end, uh, John Podesta tweeted out, you know, on Twitter, he tweeted out that uh, he felt like a failure because he couldn't convince Obama to, to do anything, to, to be the official disclosure president, you know. So he was, he was kind of bummed out about that, and so he uh, went over to Hillary and, and uh, tried there, and she seemed more... Um, more uh, comfortable with the idea. But also in these emails, and and again, it goes back to what Tom was talking about, this intimate language that's used, because nothing is really, nothing is explained as if it were the first time these people were hearing any of this. Um, So in in these emails, they talk about nonviolent ETIs, or extraterrestrial intelligences. And there are even some emails that describe them as being obedient to God. Like, they'll actually make that point in the email when they're describing them. Like, uh, as as we know, our nonviolent extraterrestrial intelligences, you know, friends, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, who are obedient to God and just want the benefit of mankind and all that. So, they describe them in that way. But, interestingly enough, they don't describe them as if they're aliens from another planet. They actually say that they come from a contiguous universe, and basically what that means is a parallel, a parallel universe or a, a higher dimension, a higher reality, where these, these intelligences actually come from. Uh, and those are all over the emails, too. And, and again, when, they're, when, they're talk, when these are talked about in these emails, it's as if everybody involved in the email already knows about it. Um, and the other point that comes up is that these beings want to bring humanity zero-point energy. And basically what zero-point energy is, it's more accurately called a vacuum energy, but uh, it's basically the idea that um, 
the, one of one of the fields of research in quantum physics is called quantum field theory, and that says that reality is composed of fields, which is basically vibrating energy. That's what reality actually is, to its fund, you know most fundamental uh, point. So, zero point energy or vacuum energy would be harnessing that energy, which would be essentially free energy, uh, and using it to power the world and stuff, which seems like it would be a pretty convenient idea. Um, but the, the, the issue is, why are these extraterrestrial intelligences pushing for this? If they want to give it to humanity so bad, why haven't they done so already? And then the answer comes up in these emails, because they are concerned with how humanity is treating the world, the, the planet, actually. Uh, and, uh, they're, they're concerned with warfare, and, and they're really, really against uh, warfare, but not in terms of humans hurting other humans. They don't care about that but humans hurting the earth. Now, interestingly enough, when we go to um, Revelation chapter 9, and it talks about these locust beings, these extra-dimensional uh, fallen beings that come up out of the bottomless pit, there's, there's an odd description of them that uh, many times has passed over, but it says that it, it's, it's commanded that, that these beings don't hurt the earth. There's something in them where they want to preserve the earth for some reason, probably for their own uses. But they don't hurt the earth; they torture the humans. Right. Uh, so it's, it's really strange that, to me, that's that's too much of a coincidence to just be a coincidence. Um, but also, uh, so in going in, in going into these emails, we're not talking about aliens from another planet anymore. I mean, I, I remember um, when I first started researching alien abductions. Uh, I started where uh, basically where it started in the fifties and sixties, and back then. When somebody would get abducted, and if they would ask the, the the being, the alien being, you know, where do you come from, they would say things like Mars or Venus or the Moon or Mercury. Well, then our technology, uh, our, we, we got better technology. We were able to actually use telescopes and satellites and see these planets uh, and, and, and measure the properties of these planets and realize that there is no way <laughs> that any kind of life is going to survive, especially on Mer Mercury. I mean, you try to build a, a spaceship on Mer Mercury, it's just going to melt. So that doesn't work. Well, around that time, uh, abductees started reporting that these aliens were saying that they were from far-off places like Zeta Reticuli and Arcturus and, and things like that, way out in the galaxy where we didn't have any hope of being able to vet their story or check up on them. But about five, ten years ago, we started, uh, we, we started to develop the technology to observe uh, the properties of exoplanets, uh, planets that are way far out in the universe. And uh, we, we can actually measure the properties. So now we're developing a way to maybe vet some of these stories. Well, once, once that happened, the, the aliens, they started changing their story again, and that's when they started saying that that was when it was becoming more popularized that they're actually – from uh, from a higher reality, uh, and, and they use a lot of terms that would that would uh, kind of coincide with our understanding of new age theology and stuff. But but basically that that they're not physical in the sense of we that we think of physicality, but they're from a higher type of reality. And we now how are how are we going to develop the technology to even be able to measure that? Well. That's what they're trying to do at CERN right now, and they're being very open about it. One of the goals of CERN, one of the actual official documented goals of CERN, is to measure these higher realities and to try to communicate with them. So when, when we found this in the Podesta emails, I mean, it, it blew our minds, because it's the same type of language used, uh, yet this is coming from more of a political standpoint, whereas CERN's coming more of a scientific standpoint, but... I, they're just they're they're just two cogs in the same wheel. So they're talking about the same uh, the same thing. So I think if there ever is a time when official disclosure happens, and I, I I personally believe that there will be. I think we're in a type of soft disclosure now, where the public is just uh, getting used to the idea that these things are possible and then that that they exist. But I think that when when it if and when it does happen, I don't think it's going to necessarily be you know. But we're here, we're aliens from another planet. That might be a piece of it, but I think more, more than that, it's going to be we're from a higher dimension. We are what the ancients worshipped as gods. 
you know, we, we, you say we're spiritual, but we're actually more real than you are. And, and I think it's going to be that type of language. So that gives, that gives people reason to worship these things. Uh, they're not just biological entities that evolved on some other planet, which is what, what they, what they would believe. But, and actually, in some of the emails that just came out yesterday, as early as yesterday, um, that, I, that Tom and I were talking about, they, they're actually saying that, specifically, these are not beings that evolved on other planets. These are beings that evolved past, uh, past warfare, past anything bad, and, and what we would consider evil. Uh, they're beyond that now, so we can learn from them. Uh, so the world's being primed to accept this stuff, and I think that uh, people like uh, uh, Podesta and all, all the politics behind the disclosure movement, I think that is meant to get the public ready for what people say at CERN and opening portals are trying to do by bringing these uh, entities into our reality. So, I mean, it, it is an absolutely insane time that we're living in. And, John, if I can add to that, you know, um you know what he's talking about official disclosure and but what you were talking about uh a few minutes ago about you know Trump going out talking about if any two agree on on certain things and would does the devil also have that kind of power you know if occultists come together and they agree uh and i would just say people ought to think back about uh, when Moses stood before the Egyptian sorcerers, and keep in mind that those sorcerers were able to re replicate uh, almost all of the miracles that Moses did that God had sent him there to do and that were being done by the hand of God. So uh, absolutely without dispute, there are occultists, especially those who may be in possession of watcher's knowledge. You know, we if you was to talk to an ancient Hebrew and ask them, when did occult knowledge come into the world, and when did sin and evil come into the world, uh, their answer would be different than ours. Evangelical Christians would say, well, that was at the fall of Adam and Eve, and that was when evil entered into the world. But if you ask an ancient Hebrew, that would not be their worldview at all. They had an Enochian. They had a worldview based on the book of Enoch. The ancient Hebrews, all of them, including the time when Jesus came on the earth, they believe that evil entered into the world when the Watchers came through a portal, when they came down onto Mount Hermon. And in fact, that, that's ex even the way the New Testament refers to them, as traversing through a portal. It says that they kept not their fixed habitation. They moved out of their reality into our reality, and that was what the Hebrews believed was the moment in time when sin and evil entered into the world, and when you read the book of Enoch, what did they do, John? They did exactly what you just, the question you just asked. They said, let us agree together. Let us put a binding upon ourselves that we are going to do this thing. And they came together, and they agreed together, and it had great, in fact, the power was so much that uh, 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 Dr. Michael Heiser I'm going to be publishing his book. It's going to come out in 2017 called Reversing Hermon, or in other words, reversing what happened at Mount Hermon. And I've, I've, I've been in ministry, and I was a pastor for 25 years. I worked for the largest evangelical organization in the world as an executive for almost a decade, and I have never saw this before in which he depicts this secret mission of, of Jesus Christ to literally reverse what the fallen watchers started at Mount Hermon. That's why the book's called Reversing Hermon. And the whole point being that when Jesus is standing there at the base of Mount Hermon and he says, the gates, the doorway, the portal, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, he is saying something that the average believer today is clueless about. Uh, and the fact that he came here literally to, to turn around, to stop, what they had started, and to make a doorway, a different doorway, a heavenly one, a pathway, a portal, an opportunity for people to be born back into the kingdom of God. Now, if I can real quickly, I want to also say something else about uh, 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 Donald Trump and what you mentioned about him, because there's something really strange right now that's unfolding. Right. And it is tied to Abaddon's ascending. Uh, and by the way, if people listening to this, if there's any out there that want to get this book, Abaddon Ascending, they should get it at skywatchtv.com, because right now, for probably what's only going to be one week, 
uh, when people get that book from skywatchtv.com, we're giving away $400 in free books, free DVDs, free Bible software, free audio sets, just a trainload of stuff. Uh, and and, and uh, Caravan to Midnight listeners are some of the only people in the world know, that know now that, that that link is actually already open. Uh, so anyway, if a person's interested in that book, get it there because that, that can help you with your Christmas shopping. But anyway, um, Excellent. don't forget, so here we have Trump, and he's standing up. He was He's the most like unlikely presidential candidate in the history of humanity, and everybody is scratching their head about how did he get here, how did he win, and so on. Uh, don't forget that dozens of ancient seers, and we've talked about this on Caravan to Midnight before, saw the year 2016, dozens and dozens, going back millennia, pointed specifically to the year 2016, in which some of them said this would be the year that the Antichrist would appear on the scene, but others said this would be the year that the Messiah would appear on the scene. And I've only, you know, imagined that the difference here is that those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah are still looking for him, but those who have would see this as the coming of Antichrist. But in any case, literally dozens and dozens, Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher from 350 years ago writing letters to Yale University, the Antichrist will be on earth in 2016. Others, 300 years ago, uh, 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 Rabbi uh, Amir Horowitz translating the uh, book of Daniel and the times, times, and half of times uh, concludes that in the Hebrew calendar year 5773, which is 2016 to 2017, based on the way they set their calendar up, but it began October last month, uh, uh, he says Messiah will appear on the earth. Now, here's something very interesting, right? So in the Zohar, uh, Zohar, written, <coughs> excuse me, 700 years ago <coughs> in medieval Aramaic, Orthodox Jewish priests, they're trying to determine when is the Messiah going to appear on the earth. And, you, and anybody can read this. It's in the, the era section of the Zohar in a subsection called Signs Heralding Mashiach or the Coming of Messiah. They say in the year 5773, the Messiah will make himself known, but only kind of secretly to the rabbis, if you will, in Israel. It, well, in our Gregorian calendar, that's 2012. Well, guess what? 2012, uh, uh, Donald Trump travels to Israel. He meets over there with Benjamin Netanyahu, members of the Likud party. He even goes on television telling people to vote for Benjamin Netanyahu and the, and the Likud party in the general election. That's 2012. Now, the, these rabbis, from that day until now, they've been saying the Messiah is here. He's made himself known. Uh, and people from all around the world, need to, uh, Jews, need to start traveling back to Jerusalem. Dozens of rabbis have said this. Anybody can Google and verify what I'm saying. He's here, right? So now you have the 300-year-old-plus prophecy of Rabbi Mir Horowitz saying, but he will become manifest, he will be known to the world in 5777. That's the year 2016 through uh, September of 2017. And all of a sudden... You have uh, Trump elected. By the way, I'm not saying Trump's the Messiah. I'm not saying that. I'm saying something very strange going on here because the minute he was elected, rabbis came forward, and now look at what they're saying. They're saying that the gematria, the numerology of Donald Trump's name, means Messiah. This, is, this has been in the news. And here's something that people ought to keep in mind. That the Jewish idea of Messiah is not like the Christian idea. We, you know, we think of Messiah, we think of Jesus, the incarnation of God, divine birth, all that. That's, that's not, the, the Jewish idea of Messiah literally means the anointed one, and it refers to the ancient practice of anointing a king, a political figure, with oil, whenever they would take the throne. Now, there are several criteria that the rabbis have put together, but when they will know, uh, uh, when the Messiah is here and what will happen during the Messiah. First, he's going to be a political figure, he's going to take the world stage, and he is going to uh, cause decisive battles to be fought in favor of the Jewish nation. And I think this is why you've heard Trump 
say, out there saying, you know, we're going we're to be against the Iran deal. We're going to stand up for uh, Israel. Nobody's going to do this any more than we have. And now while he's saying that, notice what the rabbis are doing. Because the, one of the key things, uh, according to Jewish thought about the coming of the Messiah, is they say that when he gets here, the exiles, the Jewish exiles, are going to come from around the world. They're going to gather back into the current state of Israel. And note what the rabbis are doing now. They are telling Jews from around the world, move back to Israel now because the Messiah is here and the Messianic era is about to start. Secondly, the, 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 the ancient rabbi said when the Messiah arrives, he's going to restore the temple service. And note that the rabbis now are calling on Trump, and in one case they're calling on Trump and uh, Russia's leader Putin to come and to rebuild the third temple. And then the third and final thing that is key to them is that they believe that the Messiah not only will be a great political leader, but he has to be descended from King David. He has to be of the Davidic dynasty. And right now there is an effort to to uh, to back, uh, 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 you know, what do they call it, where the um, to verify uh, uh, through the European monarchs uh, that Donald Trump is related in terms of his genealogy to descendants through several kings of England and Scot and Scottish kings that had spent a great deal of time proving that their bloodline goes all the way back to the Davidic dynasty. So I'm not telling you that Donald Trump is the Messiah. In fact, what I frankly, what I think these rabbis think, I think they think that Donald Trump is what uh, the, the New Testament equivalent of John the Baptist. Uh, a lot of people thought John the Baptist was the Messiah, even when he's in prison. They're sending letters, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you whatever? He says, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the forerunner. Uh, he that cometh after me is greater than I am. That's the Messiah. And I think that a lot of these rabbis now believe this about Trump. And several of them, well-known rabbis in Israel, have already said, they're already on record now, saying that Donald Trump has, is the start of the Messianic era. So, so talking about a doorway opening, uh, uh, if, if Donald Trump is in fact um, some kind of um, a sign that we've entered into these final end times, then you would expect somebody uh, is going to arise on the scene very soon that Christians would call Antichrist, and he will be the embodiment of Abaddon. So this is a big part of our book, Abaddon Ascending, is simply looking at everything that's happening in the world and everything that everybody who is supposed to be a theological expert or a rabbi in these issues, everything they're saying right now, they are all saying the time has arrived. Well, what else can you say but wow? Okay, so let's say it is. So the messianic era, let's say that it has arrived. Let's, let's, let's say that, yes, it's real. Do we have any idea what we can expect now, other than the, you know, the, the ones who aren't for it uh, getting even more ridiculous than they are now? They don't even make any sense as it is. I suspect as time goes by, they'll make less sense still. But I digress. Well, it is a it is a virtual smorgasbord, if you will. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we are we are go, jo, um, uh, Josh and I. We were um, day before yesterday. We were over at the Jim Baker program, and we sat there and filmed for literally five straight hours nonstop. It's going to be a whole week of broadcasting, and this question yeah. <laughs> the question came up over and over and over. Uh, it wasn't just the Zohar, uh, the, the the Mayan. The Mayan calendar, everybody, you know, nobody's thinking about it now, right? Because the Mayan calendar is counting down to the end of their long count calendar, and everything was about 2012. And because so many of the people that were, especially the New Agers, that were saying it, it represents the end of the world, you can go to Google, you can go to YouTube and you can type in my name, uh, and you can find videos in 2009. Uh, where I was saying that is absolutely not what the Mayans said. I have studied this at the university level. Uh, I've studied the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, Chick uh, the uh, Chickamauguan star constellation prophecies of the Cherokee. They were all saying the same thing. They were saying that at the end of the long count counter in 2012, it was going to give birth to a new final age. That's more interesting, right? Not the end of the world the end of an era, the end of an epoch. It's going to give birth to a new final age, and they said uh, it's going to be marked by several things. One, two great men 
are going to appear on the face of the earth that are going to change the course of history. That's what the Maya said. That's what the Chilambalam, the Jaguar Shaman, that's what he says uh, in, in the book of the Kumiel, the council book of the Yucatecan Maya, which was predicted 500 plus years ago, and not only until about 100 years ago translated into English. Uh, and, they, and he very specifically, in fact, it's pretty interesting because he tied it, the Chilambalam tied the final 13, uh, uh, what, the, what do they call it, it's 19.7 uh, uh, years, the, the final 13 steps in the Mayan calendar. He tied it to the uh, colonial count, 1776, and then said there would be 13 steps followed by the, the, the revival of Bolanya Teku from the underworld. This is the god in the underworld that is guarding the bones of the giants. And sometime after the year 2012, these bones are going to rise up from out of the underworld. Well, book of Revelation, chapter 9, the, the doors of the earth are going to open and stuff's going to come up out of the earth. Isaiah 13, I open the gates. Ye ruler, I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. So all these ancient prophecies. But the Mayan actually put a date on it, and they're saying sometime after 2012. That's exactly what the ancient Jewish rabbis said uh, in the in the Jewish calendar year 5773, 2012. The door is going to open, and by 5777, the world is going to start knowing who these two great leaders that the Maya predicted who they are. Uh, Protestant reformers said the same thing. Uh, the Great Seal of the United States, 1776, 13 steps in the Gregorian calendar. It's a 20-year cycle. It ends in the year 2016. It doesn't matter what you look at. All of these ancient sages, the occultists, all of them, for literally millennia, have said when the year 2016 gets here, that's the countdown clock. Everything from that point and forward until time times and half a time out of the book of Daniel is done. We are literally, according to all of these ancient sages, we have now just entered into what, uh, you know, what uh, dispensationalists would call the end time. Have we? Well, we're going to see. We're going to wait and see. But, but, but now it's a smorgasbord. Every interpreter on the planet is going to be out there literally trying to translate every step, everything that happens from this point and forward. Now, is it just a coincidence that at exactly the same period in time the technology of CERN exists, and they're saying we're going to open this doorway? Is it a coincidence that they build it right over the top of Apaliacom? And, and, and there's some real mystery about that, too, by the way. I didn't know this until Josh brought it up. But the Large Hadron Collider, they spent God only knows how much money, literally hundreds of millions of dollars and years, all this time, Burying that under the ground over the top of uh, uh, Apaliacom, over the top of the Abusos, according to the ancient ones, and that it didn't have to be built on the ground at all. Why did they do that? They could have built it above the ground. Why did they do that? Yeah, there's there's no real scientific advantage, and of course, you know they'll they'll have they have a couple of the kind. I, I look at, I look at them as excuses. They have a couple of like so-called reasons, but they don't make any sense because one of the reasons that they give is. Well, real estate in that area is really expensive. Okay, well, don't build it in that area then. That's the obvious answer. Uh, but so why is the answer then to spend more money to dig underground and, and do it that way? Like that, that makes absolutely no sense. But when asked why is it underground, that, that's what they've uh, gone on record to say. And then another thing that they've said is because the ground provides uh, natural shielding from radiation, not from the LHC out, but from cosmic rays going into the LHC and affecting the experiment. Uh, but the fact is, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. They're, they actually have uh, uh, neutrino detectors uh, way deeper underground uh, to detect, uh, to try to detect neutrinos. So, you know, th that, that small amount of ground isn't going to provide that much protection, especially with what they already have shielding it anyway. I mean, they spent a lot of money on the shielding of, of this big machine. So the excuses that they give, it's, you know, it's probably good enough for somebody who's just asking out of curiosity and, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not really invested in it one way or another. But uh, for me, when I look into that, uh, for, I mean, just the first thing, the real estate thing, if the real estate is that expensive, why build it in such a weird and awkward place, you know, right on the border 
of France and Switzerland. There, there's no strategic reason besides the fact, the only reason, is that that's where Apoliacom is. That, that's where uh, the bottomless pit, according to uh, ancient belief, is. That's, the, that's it. That's the only reason. There's no other uh, scientific or political reason for it to actually be there, let alone for it to be underground. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's something that to me is just uh, it's very odd. <laughs> wow. This is this is like uh, this is like almost overwhelming, really. All of this is. So, all right. Let me ask you this: since we let, let's say, and for the benefit of the audience, let's let's uh, let me just throw this out there: there is a high probability and and uh, certainly high confidence that the majority, the vast percentage of what you have said today is absolutely accurate. But let's say everything. Let's just, for the moment, just assume that everything that you have said is absolutely correct. Uh, so what exactly are we to prepare for? I mean, how are we, I mean, are, I mean, I, I keep hearing that, all of a sudden I'm hearing that song in my head, you know, so be good for goodness sakes. Whoa, somebody's coming, you know, that thing. That Venkman did it in Ghostbusters is like okay, let let's say that we really are coming to the uh, coming to the end of the line of this particular epoch. How to prepare for what's next? How can we even guess what's next? I mean, here on the ground where where we live. I mean, it's it's one thing to be okay. I'm separated from worldly stuff, and I'm going to devote the next several hours or the next several days, for that matter, to doing nothing but thinking about the. The, the higher things that a human being can think of. I'm not going to play with the Internet. I'm not going to take any phone calls. Uh, I'm just going to try to settle my mind and understand what part am I to play in the days to come. I mean, is that a fair question to ask you, fellas? Because if, if it's not, yeah, just tell that, me. That, yeah, that, that's absolutely a fair question. And I would, I would expect most people probably have that question on, on their minds. I mean, I've certainly uh, thought about that myself. For, for us, the, the main thing to do uh, to prepare for any of this is if you don't know Jesus Christ yet, to, to get right with Jesus, to uh, start a relationship with him. Or if you do know him and maybe maybe you haven't talked to him in a while, you know, talk to him. Ask him what, what he wants you to do, because everybody is here for a purpose. And it's not to be scared victims. You know, that's, that's not anybody's purpose. But uh, all, through, all throughout the Gospels, Jesus talks about being prepared, but also um, exposing the evils of the world and evangelizing. It, you know, make, making uh, uh, Christians of other people, introducing other people to Jesus. So that's what we need to do. Now, of course, looking into things like Bible prophecy and, and, and where the world is scientifically and politically is extremely important because that will tell us where we are and, and how to best uh, and most effectively reach out to people. But ultimately, we're not supposed to fear these things. You know, we're, we're told in Scripture that we're not given a spirit of fear. So I, I, I don't want the audience to make any mistake that we're, we're not here pushing books to get people scared and to sell books. You know, we, we, if, we, if we only cared about selling books, we just wouldn't do radio shows and give them away for free. Uh, um, or we wouldn't give away you know, $400 worth of free materials with our book. So it's not about that. But it's about getting the information out to as many people uh, as, as humanly possible. And I think if everybody has that mindset, first get right with Jesus, get, uh, get a relationship with Jesus, and, and find out what he put you here for. Um, and for everybody, you know, it's going to be a little different. Uh, but find, find that out. Uh, and, then, and then Jesus will lead you in how to prepare for this. And it might even just be witnessing to your neighbor. Uh, it, it, it might be that. It might be setting aside some uh, food or, or survival uh, materials. Or, I mean, any number of things. That, you know, it, it's going to depend on the individual, but it all centers around Jesus, and, and it all centers around love for one another. And I, I actually wrote the conclusion of our of our book, and that's that's what I wanted to end on. Uh, it is the idea that uh, it, the love is the most important thing. If we waste our time as Christians. Uh, as followers of Jesus, as the body of Christ, if we waste our time squabbling over these little differences in theology, we're never going to be prepared. 
you know, sometimes, and I said this on the Jim Baker uh, program, it's, sometimes I think uh, we tend to uh, forget how the body of Christ is supposed to work. You know, we're, we're told in Scripture that some are an eye, some are a hand, and basically what is it the business of the hand to tell the eye what to do? Well, what it's talking about there is that uh, Christians have, in the body of Christ, Christians have different jobs. You know, we have different things that God wants us to do, and God brings all of those things together, um, and, 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 you know, towards, towards uh, his plans. So instead of focusing on what everybody else is doing and trying to bust them down and tell them uh, what they're doing is wrong, uh, we need to focus on why we're here. Now, this also extends into how to handle... Um, non-Christians, or, or even some of the occultists and Satanists that we're talking about. Uh, believe it or not, Ephesians 6 tells us people are not our enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And when you look at the Greek of what all of those things are, who our true enemy is, they're all spiritual. They're all evil entities. Things like Abaddon and the Abyss. Our enemy is a spiritual one. Um, these Satanists and occultists and people doing all these terrible things, you could kind of think of them as prisoners of war. What we need to do is, instead of uh, hating them is focus on evangelizing them, getting them saved so they can turn their lives around and actually be a positive uh, force in the kingdom, in, in, the, uh, in the body of Christ. If we do that, that is our best hope. Uh, and getting through this in, in the best way possible. So if, it, if this is all true, and, you know, in the book we put out possibilities. You know, we're not saying, we're not making predictions and claims. We're putting out, here's the evidence, here's what we think it means, uh, you know, just, just for, for the audience. But if we can get a handle on centering every decision uh, around Christ, that's going to give us our best hope. Christ, Christ is our only hope. Well, and let me add to that, um, we, you know, uh, all that stuff we're giving away over there, we're actually also including a couple of other books. We're actually putting three new books out all at the same time. We're giving the other ones away. One of them is by Dr. Michael Lake called The Sharif Imperative, and it talks about empowering the church for the end time, things like that, how people can live victorious lives. And we're putting out another one called Final Fire is the Next Great Awakening right around the corner because we think that part of what is happening in our world today uh, implies that we may be on the cusp of another great awakening, maybe even the last great awakening, and how long that would last is all in God's hands. But it could be one of the most prosperous times politically. Uh, note how with the election of Trump, all of a sudden we're setting records on Wall Street, jobs are staying in America. It could be good in those kind of ways. This could be this generation's Reagan moment, if you will. But it could also be good in the sense that in the 1960s, uh, you know, the, the Jesus People movement. These were all, interesting, isn't it? These were all uh, anti-establishment uh, young people. By, by the way, I know this because I was in it. I lived through it. I, my hair used to hit all the way down to my butt, John, if you can imagine <laughs> that on old ball-headed me, right? But I was right in the middle of all that. My brother had a rock band, that was, they, and, and they were doing really well. They had won the Battle of the Bands playoffs at Big Surf. They were opening for Santana and Rare Earth and Steppenwolf, and so I was right in the middle of all this stuff, right? Uh, uh, all the Woodstock stuff. But these, but what was cool was these anti-establishment young people who were against the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, Country Joe McDonald at Woodstock. Don't ask. You know, what are we fighting for? Don't ask me. I don't give a damn. The next stop is Vietnam. Uh, all that uh, anti-establishment stuff. Uh, was against the government. It was against the establishment government in the same way that I think you see now a movement that just got Donald Trump elected. These people don't want another dynastic presidency. They don't have faith anymore in the Republicans in name only, the Rhinos or the Democratic Party. Uh, and it was enough of a groundswell, a grassroots, organic kind of movement that it done what none of the so-called experts could have ever predicted. Well, this so much reminds me of what was happening in the 60s and the early 70s. But ultimately, that also gave birth to what was called the Jesus People Movement. Among all those hippies, Jesus was like the most popular guy on earth. Why? Well, because he was like the ultimate anti-establishment guy. He was, was anti-organized religion. He was anti-organized government. Uh, but he cared about people. This is what Josh was talking about. He cared about people. When the religious people wanted to bring 
you know, here is a prostitute. We caught her right in the very act. And now Moses says we should kill her. What do you say? And his answer is classic, right? Let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone. When they all walk away embarrassed, and he just simply looks at this woman in love and says, go and sin no more. So that I think we now have a new era for this. The other thing I would add when you're when you say uh, uh, Tom and, and Josh, let's imagine you're all right, and the doorway to the underworld is set to open, and all this terrible stuff's going to happen. What are we to do about it? Well, first of all, those who belong to God don't have to worry about it because if you read the whole book of Re- uh, the whole uh, ninth chapter of Revelation, he very much says that all that stuff that's coming up out of the underworld, he says, do not touch those who have the seal of God. On them, so those who belong to God are not going to be touched by this anyway. Now, for those who do not belong to God, well, then it also says this: it says men's hearts are going to fail them for fear, for seeing those things that are coming upon the earth. So, it's a very important time, you know, to know who you are and who you belong to and where your devotions are. And then, thirdly, I would just say we're going to see if Josh and I are right. We're going to find out if. CERN and some of our other speculations in Abaddon ascending play a role. Uh, and I should also tell people they're going to they're going to find some really interesting uh, 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 you know investigation in this research that they've never seen anywhere else. Like for instance, we asked the question, uh, okay, it, the Book of Revelation, speaking of Abaddon, it says that the world is going to marvel when he that was not or he that was and yet is not and yet shall be again. They're going to stand back and marvel at the resurrection of this very powerful uh, personality who was known in ancient times. The Sumerians called him Gilgamesh. In the Bible, he's called Nimrod. Uh, The Greeks called him Apollo. The Egyptians called him Osiris. But this great, mighty, powerful person who was and was not and yet shall be, how does he come back? In other words, if you try to think of this, in terms of science, right? How does resurrection science work? This is one of the things that we investigate. How do they, how do, well, and, and for that matter, also the, 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 you know, Bolognateku from the Mayans or, uh, Isaiah saying that the dead Raphaim, the spirits of the dead giants are going to be reanimated and, and rise back up to the earth. How in the world does that happen? So we spend a whole chapter in there. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, okay, how did this work? Uh, there was this, you know, like L.A. Marzulli and guys like that, they'll refer to the first incursion of giants that happened before the flood, right? But in between then and this prophesied end times event where they're going to come back, there was also what some people call a second incursion of Nephilim, Anakim, Gibberim. This was the time of Nimrod, the builder of Babel. How in the world uh, did that happen? Because... When you, when you read the scripture around this, it's very clear that everything before the flood was wiped out. All the giants, uh, they're all wiped out. How in the world did they come back? So we spend, I think people are going to love that entire chapter. We spend a whole lot of time in there talking about all the theories. One being that, like Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, you know, he, he looks at that verse that, that says, uh, when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and the sons of God, the Bneha Elohim, saw the daughters of men, came down, blah, blah, blah. He says that that, and, and Mike is ultimately qualified to, you know, to, to analyze this. He says that, that that verse from the Hebrew can equally just be translated whenever. Not just when, but whenever, meaning that it could happen again, that, that more watchers could decide that they were going to involve themselves with women, and it simply just could have happened over again. And then there's another possibility about how this happens, uh, and that is that there is a kind of occult science, not just physics, metaphysics, that was given by the watchers. Because, again, Mount Hermon, when they came down, if you read the Book of Enoch, it doesn't just say they came down mated with women. It talks about all this secret knowledge that they brought with them, the knowledge of heaven, the knowledge of creation, the knowledge of weapons making, the knowledge of allures, incantations, and sorcery, and and all that kind of stuff. They brought all of that with them, and that, that was supposed to have been wiped out in the flood and lost forever, except when you read the book of Jubilees, chapter 8, 
And it talks about how after the floodwaters abated, Noah's grandson, Canaan, uh, was out walking along, and he found where all of the knowledge of the watchers had actually been engraved in the stone as part of a mountain. And after the waters went down, he recovered the, the secrets of the watchers, including this idea of the reanimation of the dead spirits of the giants in the underworld known as Rapha or Raphaim. And so we go into that and we investigate what parts of that uh, might be reality. And then the third part that we look at are magic beds. Uh, Og, uh, you know, the King Og, uh, his bed, uh, uh, Steve Quayle, our mutual friend, says it was 18 feet long. Other people, the way they measure a caseta, they say that it was, um, uh, I think, 12 feet long. But in, but, but in either case, this is a really big guy, right? Right. But what a lot of people don't know is that there was a bed identical to the one that belonged to King Og that was actually found at the Tower of Babel. And their information was recovered that talks about how that bed was used uh, for occult lovemaking between the god Marduk and his divine wife, uh, Zarpanitu, whose name actually means creatress of seed. And there is reasons to believe that there was an occult kind of magic that was used for bringing up uh, these uh, entities from the underworld. So anyway, I don't mean to get off on all that, but, we, but and, and, and even the Bible itself, Ezekiel, um, God talks about this, uh, this magic uh, as if it actually does work, as if you can actually expel the spirit of a living human and replace it with an underworld spirit that's been dead so that it then becomes incarnate in that individual, reanimated. Uh, and that's actually in the, that's that God himself actually talks about that in the Bible. A lot of people don't know that. So that would have been a, a an uber high level of occult knowledge. Well, that goes exactly to what is going to happen in January. In a few weeks from now, when, uh, uh, President elect Trump is inaugurated, while he is standing in the belly of ISIS in the U.S. Capitol Dome facing the obelisk, which is all Egyptian, uh, design, Across town, just a little ways from the White House, at the House of the Temple, the 33rd degree Freemasons are going to conduct the ancient Egyptian ritual of the raising of Osiris. And they do that in hopes that that spirit will take its rightful place in every U.S. president until the day that the president of the United States assumes his role as the king over planet Earth. And the Masons believe that uh, Henry Wallace, the 33rd degree uh, I mean, the 33rd vice president, 32nd degree Freemason, and then the 32nd president, Roosevelt. This is all in their own biographies. Wallace wrote about it extensively, that the prophecy on the Great Seal was a Masonic prophecy that looked forward to the day when Osiris would rise from the underworld, or what the uh, Greeks would call Apollo, or what the Bible calls Abaddon or Apollyon, would rise up from out of the underworld to be incarnate in a future president of the United States to take his rightful place as the leader of the New World Order. But the, the very people that put that uh, seal, the great seal of the United States, on the U.S. $1 bill, both the president and the vice president, their books can be read in which they admit that themselves, that that's exactly why they did it. And so, and I've been to the House of the Temple. I've had a private tour there with two 33rd degree Freemasons. They admitted this to me. U.S. congressman admitted it to me. U.S. senator admitted it to me that that ritual does, in fact, occur. And nobody listening to your program is going to be able to refute what I'm saying because that is, in fact, what they do. Wow. That's good stuff, Tom. Seriously. <clears throat> Josh? Yes, sir. You're going to have to fight for some airtime, pal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am learning from the best here. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm being schooled at the knee of the master. I, seriously, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. I... Uh, so what's coming up? I know I know you're, it's going to be the Watchman Conference in uh, March, right? Uh, but what, what's what's going on between now and then? That's a third of a year almost. Well, Tom and I do have some plans in the works. We're doing uh, we're doing active active research uh, in, in just uh, some of the stuff that we talked about today. I probably shouldn't talk too much about it because uh, you know it might be too early. Also, there's a uh, an upcoming. Um, project that led us to the Four Corners uh, area of, of America to look at um, 
some ideas about the ancient Anasazi. And uh, again, probably I probably shouldn't say too much, but just to whet your, the appetites of your uh, audience, there's uh, there's some pretty phenomenal things in the works that I, I think people are really going to be able to get a lot out of. Now that's that sounds really good. Look, um, I uh, I could sit here for a lot longer and and talk with you. Is there um? Look, you know, let me let me go back to something we started talking about about an hour and a half ago. This 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 thing at CERN with the with the simulated human sacrifice. Now somebody wound up saying, "Oh, it's just a bunch of tourists there that decided to do something weird. It was just for kicks." And then there was that weird um, uh, dedication of that tunnel in Switzerland with some, some sort of a creepy modern dance that looked really stupid, but obviously everybody who was involved was really into it, right? And then um, and then you do have this. Um, the statue of Shiva out front. You know, when you look at military patches, some of them have got a lot of skulls and flames and daggers and all kinds of stuff on them. Real fierce army stuff. Okay, I get it, you know. Uh, I even had a, a chef's apron one time. You know, there was an olive drab and it had a skull on it. It said, you know, death from within. But that was just a joke. So... But we re- I just want to hammer this one more time. The people that are doing this stuff and using this symbology with Shiva statue and, and, uh, and doing, the, doing the, the freaky dance and the ritual uh, sacrifices and so forth, are these just idiots fooling around? You know, hey, we'll have a little fun with it. We'll creep out the rest of the world. Or is it your opinion? I think you've already stated it, but I guess I'm asking for you to state it again. Or do you think these, these people are really serious about this, that they really don't care about you know, the, he whose name should not be spoken, that would be the most holy high God, the God Almighty, or Jesus. They're not, they're not into either one of them. They reject it. They've decided to go the other way. They're convinced that they don't need that, that they can be as God. They're as crazy as Satan. They think they can kill God. They think they can replace his universe with their own universe and make themselves God. Is that where they're really at, or are, they, or are these people play-acting some of this just to kind of go on along to get along? Because I've, I've seen, I, I, I you know, I believe that they're serious about it. I believe that the ones that are actually, actually involved in these rituals and setting these things up, and, and again, this this isn't the majority of the employees at CERN or, or, or physicists around the world. This is, but th- these are the people behind the scenes. And when you actually look at in detail uh, the symbolism around what what they're doing, and when we do go into great detail in the book to explain very clearly. Uh, why we believe that this is, these, these actions are deliberate and why they're trying to uh, bring something forth using uh, the, these, these parodies and, uh, and these weird dedication ceremonies and stuff. It, it's not just uh, the rest of the world might look at it and say that they're just playing around. And on the surface, it would seem like that. I mean, even when the CERN employees did that, uh, did that parody human sacrifice, uh, they were wearing white tennis shoes, you know, under their black robes. And, you know, so on the surface, it would just seem like, oh, they're just, you know, they're just stupid kids. And But the reality of it, when you actually look at the symbolism and compare it to things like Aliester Crowley, like uh, what, Tom, what Tom brought up earlier, um, there's too many parallels. There's, there's too many uh, what would be coincidences for this to actually be coincidence. They, they know exactly what they're doing, and they believe that these actions are necessary uh, to bring Abaddon, essentially, in, into, into the world and uh, put him in power. So, I mean, that, that's the reality of the situation that we're looking at. Well, for, well furthermore, um, John, you said, you know, how, how do we know these weren't just, you know, a bunch of tourists? Well, they, they weren't. They were behind the gates. You can't get in there. They, yeah. these, these were people who had to be employees that had the right kind of passes that got them inside the grounds at CERN. These were employees. And by the way, CERN even admitted that. So you can Google yep. this, read it for yourself. CERN admitted that this was some of their own employees, which then, uh, you know, leads you to, to ask this question, well, why in the world, first of all, would they have even done that? seems like it'd be just the dumbest thing on earth to bring a bunch of negative publicity against, uh, you know, against CERN. But let's just say it was a prank. Uh, it was a parody. Uh, as far as Ali Astor Crowley was concerned, thank you very much, because any time you do these parodies, these, these the symbolic gestures 
you are inviting dark supernaturalism. It is the gateway. It is the doorway. That's why when you're in Sunday school as a child, they teach you these little songs, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little ears what you hear, because there is an eye gate, there is an ear gate, there is a mind gate, there is a tongue gate. When you start repeating these parodies, these rituals that are meant to be repeated, um, they have a way of getting into your spirit, a way of getting into your soul. Then thirdly, you have to ask yourself, what in the world is being talked about behind the locked doors at the Large Hadron Collider that these people would have even done this? What are they hearing inside? What is the scuttlebutt in there? I'd love to be a fly on the wall to find out what are the conversations they're hearing that would make them say, hey, let's, let's do a parody of a, of, a, of a human sacrifice. But then it wasn't just them. It's everything else that's been happening in our culture, and it was the Gothard-based tunnel ceremony, which was highly uh, satanic. Uh, and then step outside the doors at CERN, and you have the, the Shiva god. And it isn't just the, the fact that it's a Hindu god, but it actually has a placard underneath it, a dedicatory underneath it, in which this god is named as the new omnipresent god, the all-powerful god. So it's a replacement of Jehovah. It's a replacement of Yahweh as the all-seeing, all-powerful, all-knowing god. So... There is definitely a specific religious connotation uh, that is connected there, not just science, but metaphysics, not just physics, but metaphysics. And then, of course, when you think about some of the mysterious stuff that the Bible says, so you go back to the Podesta emails, and they're referring to contiguous uh, aliens, to aliens that live all around us that are in a, another dimension. Uh, and, and how could they have been so convinced? that in 2017 there's going to be an official disclosure moment. And by the way, the Vatican's also connected. One of the, some of the, several of the emails actually in the Podesta emails refers to the people who represent the Vatican meeting with them towards official disclosure. So this goes back to some of the other shows we've done. When I went up to Mount Graham and I met with the Jesuits up there and all of that conversation. Um, but it's the Bible itself. That, that says some intriguing things. First of all, that the Antichrist will appear with lying signs and wonders, Second uh, Thessalonians 2 9. So, what is it? Lying signs and wonders? I mean, what? I don't know. Is that UFOs? Is that aliens? I don't know what that is. But it also says his coming is going to be marked by fearful sights and great signs from heaven. That's in Luke 21. And, and when Malachi Martin was asked by Art Bell, you know, back in 1997 on Coast to Coast AM, uh, you know, why is the Vatican on the top of that mountain in Mount Graham? What are they doing up there? And he, he said, it's because at the highest levels of Vatican jurisprudence and governance, they know what is approaching the earth and that it is going to be of the utmost importance in coming years. So, uh, and then, of course, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be aligned with the powers of the air. They're going to even be able to call down fire from heaven. Uh, one of the mo most intriguing uh, uh, places in Scripture that I think might be hinting at some of this is in Daniel, where he says that the Antichrist is actually going to champion the worship of a strange alien god. He actually says that in Daniel 11, in his estate. He will honor the god of forces. This is physics. Uh, the god who has the power over forces. We even call the, the, the four forces of physics, you know, the strong force, weak forces, blah, blah, blah. He says he's going to honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers did not know is going to be honored. Uh, he's going to be in, in the stronghold with this strange God, uh, and, uh, 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 and, and, and they're literally going to divide the world for gain. I can't quote the scripture now that I have to. But, but it's a very interesting, unusual piece of scripture to be referring to the god of forces or the god of fortresses uh this was baal shaman uh in in the ancient world literally the lord of the heavens the lord of the high places a, a deity that was considered the greatest angel of light so there's some very strange stuff that is going on uh and i think that you know people like me and josh have uh, all kinds of reasons to be really attentive now uh, to what is happening and what's going on 
Oh, and I should also say, on that giveaway over there, that $400 and free books and DVDs and Bible software, it covers an awful lot of this material about, you know, aliens, what are they really, what's going on at CERN. It's not just Abaddon ascending, but that entire collection over there is like a treasure trove that goes, uh, even the Book of Enoch. I mean, so we're, the, the stuff that they're giving away over there is unbelievable. Uh, and it will, it'll take people that get that a long time to go through all of that material, including hours and hours and hours and hours of both audio and television programming, literally discussing this very subject. One of, one of the programs alone over there they're giving away is a five hour investigative report into this very subject matter that was broadcast on television just recently. And we own it. And so we packaged it and we're giving that away too. So there's just a huge amount of stuff. That'll kind of take all the little bits and pieces we've been talking about today, and uh, and allow people to basically get a small university degree in this subject matter. Wow, that's amazing. All right, well, what um, what is the preferred website where people can go to access the greatest volume of your information, books? Well, you yeah, know, I mean, TV shows, everything. Huh? I'm sorry. No, I said books, TV show, everything. Yeah, skywatchtv.com. Josh Peck works for skywatchtv. Uh, skywatchtv.com full time. So do I. Uh, there's 20 of us now that are that are uh, off running and operating skywatchtv.com. Uh, we are also on television. That's why I said I want to. And by the way, our audience is getting huge. Just our Roku programming alone is over one and a half to two million program plays per month right now That's so excellent. i want to get you on our broadcast television program so that people can so that any of our audience that doesn't already know you i can't imagine that'd be very many but but it could be uh we want to expose uh john what you do because we believe in caravan to midnight we believe in you we believe you're one of the most important soul voices out there so we want to record you at the uh watchman's conference uh, make that a part of it, but skywatchtv.com. Uh, and right now, if they go there, there's a big giant banner on the top of the website, and it says it's the biggest giveaway in our history, and it is. And they can click on it, and they can read about all that stuff themselves. But they can also, down below that, they can see Into the Multiverse with Josh Peck. Uh, we have a daily news analysis with Derek and Sharon Gilbert. We have Sci Friday. Uh, we're getting ready to start another program called The Awakening, which is the upside of everything that we've been talking about. Uh, Jill Artis and other people will be part of that. So uh, uh, there's all kinds of content that is produced on a daily basis and also a weekly basis. And then, of course, they can click on channels up there and see all the uh, t uh, broadcast television networks that we're on now uh, around the nation as well if they want to, you know, to, to watch us that way. All right, fantastic. And I just want to add, too, if, uh, if people find us on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, you, you can go to YouTube. You can even just type in Skywatch TV, or if you're specifically looking for Into the Multiverse, you can go to YouTube.com slash Into the Multiverse. We also have Sci Friday and Skywatch Women One-on-One. -on -one. And all these programs, if you subscribe, uh, it's, it's totally free to do so. You just click the little subscribe button in the video, and then you have access to all past Future and future uh, episodes of those shows. So I, I would highly encourage people to, to subscribe to those channels on YouTube. Uh, and I've gone to the sharpeningreport.com here. And, um, and yep, that, one, that one is uh, my, my personal website. Everything that's just Josh Beck is at uh, sharpeningreport.com. Well, you've got this thing here that says all this for only thirty nine ninety five, and there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11... Uh, yeah, that's that's the link to this big big giveaway deal that Skywatch wow. TV is uh, is putting out with uh, with our book Abaddon Ascending. Yeah, it goes straight to Skywatch TV store if you click on it, folks, and it's like, I mean, who would not do this? There's enough material to keep you busy there for a solid year, easily. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, and, and it'll be really obvious to anybody that looks at it that you know we're not making money on this. We're using other resources actually to underwrite, but we believe in what we're doing and we believe that it's really important, uh, but you should know that you are you are only one of two programs, and we're doing programs back-to-back -back every day right now, but you're only one of two that we've even told that if they go there and click on that, it's actually linked into the store right now. Everybody else has just a countdown clock up there that says that it's coming next week. But if, they're really, if they really want 
to do this. It's first come, first serve, well supplies last, blah, blah, blah. So if they're interested in what we were talking about and a bunch of other stuff, at least just go there and, and scan down through that page and look at all of the crazy amount of stuff that's being given away for free. And then if they want to get Abaddon Ascending, they can do that and then and get all that other stuff while supplies last. So, you know, we don't care if they sell it. We don't care if they keep it. We don't care if they give it to people as Christmas presents. We've had people that ask, well, can I go there and buy a thousand sets and resell it in my store? And we've said, we don't care. As long as, while it's there, while it lasts, there it is. When it's gone, it's gone. I think you should probably do this, folks. You should at least go and take a look. This is really extraordinary. There's so much here, you can't believe it. Uh, um, I'm not even going to go through it right now. I'm just going to tell you, go there. Go to Skywatch TV. Go to the Sharpening Report. It's just Sharpening. Re- no, it's the Sharpening Report. No, wrong. It's, it's, it's just it's, Sharpening it's Report. Sharp, it's, no, the. <laughs> yeah, no, the. Yeah, it's SharpeningReport.com. Yeah. Yeah, you should do it. I'm telling you, you're messing up if you don't. Gentlemen, what a pleasure it was to speak with you again. John, it's always so great to be on with you. I, I And Josh will verify that I'm telling you the truth. I had told him earlier, I know we had some technical uh, difficulties getting on, and I said, oh, yeah. if this was not John Wells, I would just go to dinner. But I am. if this is John Wells, I'm sitting here, I'm staying here, I'm waiting, because I, I love doing media with you. Well, it goes both ways. Yeah, and thanks I, for and having I, me. I absolutely agree. I mean, this is, uh, like I said before, this is my second time on the program, and both times have been a blast. And, and uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, John. And, it, it, you know, for, for us, it was absolutely worth the wait. You know, I, I, wouldn't even, I would not even bore you with the details of the technical anomalies that we deal with all the time. I mean, I've just gotten used to it. Before, it would make me sort of, you know, annoyed, irritated, Okay, a little bit crazy, but we just soldier through it now. Today it was uh, today it was a melted modem, and we had to have techs out here to to look at the internet and and just find out why we got all our lights flashing, but nothing's happening. What's the problem? So anyway, thanks for hanging in there with us, and I look forward to seeing you in March. Between now and then, uh, happy Christmas to you both, and uh, and a very happy New Year. You too. John. You too. All right. Take care. All right. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, wow. Was that something or was that something? Okay, well, it's up to everybody who listens to this program to do their own research and determine what they want to take to heart and what they don't. But these are two very dedicated men, two of many who are out there doing the work. And you just heard what Tom said. He doesn't doesn't care if you buy this stuff and and, uh, sell it. He doesn't care. Um, And clearly, the amount of stuff that's, that's put out here I don't understand how they could, they could possibly do anything except go into the red on this. But again, they don't care. The important thing to people like Josh and Tom is get the word out. It's much more valuable than anything money's going to buy for you, that's for sure. Yeah, I know money's part of it, but it certainly isn't everything. Okay? So, talk to you tomorrow night on Arc Midnight, 10 to midnight on radio station KLIF. I believe we're going to speak with Mike Presnell. He's going to be working with the Trump administration over this whole border thing. And um, your calls, a lot of fun, a few good tunes, a good time, good talk, the usual. All right? Between now and then and beyond, exercise caution in your daily affairs. Keep those eyes up always. And make ready for what's to come. Be seeing you. And we have a very interesting program for you. We're going to speak with Tom Horn, and we're going to speak with the one and only Josh Peck. I'll tell you, these people are really, really busy. I want to tell you a little bit about them, but first I want to tell you, um, after that uh, that, uh, almost almost hour-long televised thank you speech from Donald Trump last night, (laughs) you look around the news today, and there's just not that much, you know, hair-raising stuff. Other than the Navy is admitting its new fleet has a near zero chance of completing a 30-day mission. These new littoral uh, ships that they've uh, produced went hundreds of millions of dollars over budget. And they're not exactly what they were hoping for, much like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. That thing went over budget so badly it was ridiculous. And it still doesn't do everything they wanted it to do. It's, uh, it's pretty weird. That's what happens when you want the contract more than you really want the product to be good, I'm afraid. 
It's pretty uh, pretty tough. That was a rather inspirational speech. I got to tell you, <laughs> when I watch Donald Trump's hand gestures, it looks a little mafia, <laughs> doesn't it? I don't think all New Yorkers uh, do hand gestures like that, but the connected ones do. Uh, let's see, over the weekend, uh, Italy is facing populist anger as populism sweeps the globe. America's white population is declining as the, um, as the Hispanics' population is increasing. I wonder, I wonder how that happened. Oh, I know, they have larger families. Anyway, the uh, number of Caucasian babies born was not as high as the number of Caucasian post-babies dying. So look out, extinction beckons, right? $31 million stolen, a Russian hack. This whole thing about Russia hacking everything turns out to be total rubbish. And speaking of rubbish, this is a good one from uh, Zero Hedge about all this global warming and climate change, which they're trying to sort of roll into one. Global warming didn't get them very far, as you know. So they went with climate change, and we know that climate change is a, is a real thing. First of all, we have this thing called weather. And, uh, and we have the four seasons, and the weather changes during the four seasons when they change. And we do know that insurance policies have been written for many years, uh, pointing out things like, uh, your property is on a 50-year floodplain. Your home is situated on a 100-year floodplain, or a 150-year floodplain. The Almanac is still a pretty good place to uh, find out what's going to happen with your weather. They don't call it the Farmer's Almanac for nothing, and this country's eaten pretty well for, well, quite a long time. But back to this, um, back to this vanishing sea ice thing. The sea ice is gone. The polar bears are stranded on little snowballs floating out there. They're having to use snowballs as floaties, the pull, p- poor bears. Well, the Telegraph.co.uk has reported the following. New analysis suggests that conditions are now virtually identical to when the Terra Nova and Endurance sailed to the South Pole, the continent of Antarctica, in the early 1900s, indicating that declines are part of a natural cycle and not the result of global warming. Here's another one. We know that sea ice in the Antarctic has increased slightly over the past 30 years since satellite observations began. Scientists have been grappling to understand this trend in the context of global warming. Well, you can grapple all you want, but within the context of global warming, you're going to come up with zip, bupkis, zeroid, nada. These new findings suggest it's not anything new. Here's another one. If ice levels were as low a century ago as estimated in this research, then a similar increase may have occurred between then and the middle of the century when previous studies suggest ice levels were far higher. Now, (laughs) Tyler Durden submitted this one. It's actually submitted by Martin Armstrong via armstrongeconomics.com. And this is what he wrote. I had a conversation in a hotel with someone who was very much a believer in man-created global warming. I began to notice a pattern to their thinking. When you test anything, you must see how it is connected to other reasoning. What emerged was a fundamental belief that government is good and there to take care of you until you die. This notion appears to be linked to those who just want to be taken care of, but not to the point that they are on welfare. They will pretend to be independent thinking individuals, but there is a core surrender of independence because they do not want to think no one is in charge and understand that the only news that they can trust must come from corporate media. I mean, this is absolutely insane. Citing a Washington Post article about face news that's been vehemently debunked for relying on a Russian propaganda list that includes even left-wing sites critical of Hillary Clinton, Matt Bay, B-A-I, or maybe that's Matt Bai, says social media giants like Facebook censoring fake news will not be enough. 
He says, quote, the answer doesn't lie in hectoring tech companies into policing content, but rather in teaching our kids how to consume it. R- writes by before going on to argue for having media literacy classes in schools that would instruct students on how to discern trustworthy sources of information. Here's a quote. Here's a radical thought. If President Trump is looking for a bold and useful education initiative that might serve the incidental purpose of redeeming what's left of his soul, media literacy would be a pretty good place to start. Getting behind a nationwide push in K-12 through classrooms could be an important and unifying priority for the incoming Education Secretary, Betsy DeVoe. Well, who puts out more fake news than mainstream media? Did you see that nonsense going on last night on Fox News between a lefty and a, and a righty and Megyn Kelly in the middle? I really believe Megyn Kelly should go on and make, um, make the move to CNN. She'll be welcome there. They could use the ratings. They're dismal. They really are. The largest Venezuelan bill of Bolivars is worth two American cents. You got to stop at about six ATMs hoping to be able to pull some money out before you can even then begin foraging for groceries somewhere. It's absolutely insane. Oil prices went into the toilet, and so did that economy. And Maduro is not doing well down there. I always blame the leader. Isn't it interesting, though? Finally, we got around to blaming President Obama for stagnant economy, poor race relations, poor foreign policy, outrageous spending. Where did all that money come from? Funding these uh, companies like Solyndra and others, while his buddy-buddy Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, they voted for Hillary as well. And this all seems linked to this desire not to be responsible for the future in a subtle way. Perhaps it's linked to childhood when you didn't have to work or cook. They just took care of you. It seems that those who believe in global warming are more likely to trust government. What happens when they wake up and discover nothing is as they thought it would be? Meanwhile, the energy output of the sun is dropping faster than anyone expected. Snow has actually begun falling in Tokyo and other parts of eastern Japan. Tokyo recorded its first November snowfall since 1875 when the government started collecting records. But hey, now they want to call this climate change and somehow still attribute this to mankind. I've said this many, many times. Mother Nature seems uh, seems to think she needs to like save herself. She'll deal with the humans. You don't have to worry about that. Mother Nature will take care of herself. The only thing that could might maybe thwart that for a few, eh, maybe millennia, is uh, widespread detonations of uh, nuclear weapons. That, that might hold her off a little bit. But other than that, Father Son and Mother Earth, I'm not a sun worshiper. Don't anybody get crazy on the Facebook now. I'm not a Gaia kind of guy either, all right? They're going to take care of themselves. The sun does what it wants. So I know. Why don't we insist that I know. The presence of woo-woo thinking people, misdirected as it appears to have been, has actually caused the sun to go to sleep for a while. Very, very low sunspot activity. And therefore, what we need, we need a, I know, a solar tax so that we can develop ways to make the sun behave the way we think that it should behave rather than just get a coat when it's cold and maybe strip down to shorts and a T-shirt when it's hot. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And, you know, we used to say things like, hey, that's really crazy. Oh, hey, crazy. Man, that's some crazy stuff, man. Ooh, you're crazy. But it's the good crazy. Or maybe that one over there, that's the bad crazy. I'm beginning to think that these people are really members of the bad crazy sect of humanity. I mean, for example... This one character, this Yahoo News columnist, wants schools to begin to indoctrinate kids so that they will trust mainstream media. Puts together this foundation that hauls in 
countless hundreds of millions of dollars. And by the way, there is the possibility she may, she may be prosecuted still. I guess we'll have to just wait and see. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Tom Horn and Josh Peck. Tom Horn is a longtime television and radio personality. His site is skywatchtv.com. He serves as the chief executive officer of Skywatch. And at the dawn of the Internet, Tom Horn launched two news services where coverage of late-breaking news and information were on the cutting edge. Stories covering religion, prophecy, discovery, and the supernatural through in-depth investigative reports. Uh, Well, this led his network of writers being referenced and interviewed by the biggest names in broadcast, including the L.A. Times Syndicate, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, Fox, Time, the New York Times, the, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, BBC, MSNBC, Michael Savage, Caravan to Midnight with John B. Wells. Thanks, Tom. Sci-Fi Channel, History Channel, Hannity and Combs, Sid Roth's It's Supernatural, The Jim Baker Show, Celebration, Daystar TV, Faith TV, The Harvest Show, The 700 Club, Coast to Coast AM, World Net Daily, Newsmax, White House Correspondents, and dozens of other news magazines and press agencies around the globe. Skywatch TV is the consummation and new mothership of Tom's several subsidiaries, including Defender Films and Defender Publishing. His uh, latest book, Abaddon Ascending. All right, now, Josh Peck is an avid researcher of fringe topics, videographer at Skywatch TV, creator of The Sharpening Report, hosted by James DeWitt and Jake Rikotska host of Into the Multiverse, and is the author of numerous books, including Abaddon Ascending, which he did with Tom Horn, The Conspiracy at the Center of CERN's Most Secretive Mission, Quantum Creation, Does the Supernatural Lurk in the Fourth Dimension, and Cherubim Chariots, Exploring the Extra-Dimensional Hypothesis. Josh Peck has been featured on TV and radio shows, including Skywatch TV. He's been on Caravan to Midnight a couple of times, and the Hagman and Hagman Report. He's a family man. He's married to Christina Peck, has three kids, and he works full-time in ministry, dedicating his life to Skywatch TV, into the multiverse, writing books, and providing for his family. And so, you know, the people at CERN didn't decide, oh, well, we're bored, we're not going to do this anymore. (laughs) Not 